You are ready to go. All right, I am calling to order this special meeting of the Lebanon Planning Board on Monday, May 18th, 2020 at 6.32 p.m. And we're doing this remote via Microsoft Teams. Uh, Tim, I'll turn it over to you for review of the meeting procedures and then I'll do a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank this is Chair. Tim Corwin, Corwin with, with the Planning with the Department. Um, David Brooks, the Planning Director, is also here this evening, as well as Brian Vincent, the City Engineer. I just have a few opening remarks to make relative to our meeting online this evening. Uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic and pursuant to Governor Sununu's Emergency Order No. 12, issued on March 23, 2020, in accordance with Executive Order 2020-04, the Lebanon Planning Board is authorized to meet electronically without a quorum physically present in the same location. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with Emergency Order No. 12, the City of Lebanon has taken action to provide public access to the meeting by telephone with potential additional access by video, to provide public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, and to provide a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. For this meeting, Microsoft Teams is being used as the communication platform. All members of the planning board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and to participate in the meeting by visiting lebanonnh.gov slash live and clicking on the link for the May 18th, 2020 planning board meeting. Instructions on how to attend are provided on the webpage. To assist in the preparation of the meeting minutes and to ensure all participants are aware of who is participating, we ask that all speakers uh, identify themselves uh, and to spell their first and last names before beginning to speak. Likewise, we do ask that all board members and staff uh, please identify yourself before speaking. In order to ensure the best possible transmission of the meeting content, it is suggested that you disable the camera on your chosen device to reduce the video feed and increase the available bandwidth for all attendees. To improve sound quality and reduce the amount of feedback in the system, microphones will be muted by staff until you have a question or comment. For people using the Microsoft Teams platform, you can unmute yourself by clicking the button on the screen. For people calling in by phone, please press star six to unmute yourself. If anyone has difficulty with access during the course of the meeting, please email us at planning at lebanonnh.gov. Again, that's planning at lebanonnh.gov or use the chat function on Microsoft Teams to indicate the issue that you're having. If we can provide technical assistance, we will try to do so. If we are unable to do so, it is still worthwhile to be aware of the problems that participants may be encountering so that we can try and address those for future meetings. Uh, in the event that we experience widespread and, and uh, serious technical difficulties such that we are unable to hold the meeting, the meeting will, will be adjourned and rescheduled to a later date. Please note that the public hearing tonight will be continued to the June 8th, 2020 meeting of the Planning Board. Continuing the application will allow for additional public testimony in the event that anyone is unable to access the meeting. For anyone who would like to provide testimony but could not as a result of technical, technical difficulties in accessing this evening's meeting, please send your questions or comments on the proposed project by email to planning at lebanonnh.gov. For additional information, please call the Planning and Development Department at 603-448-1457. All votes that are taken during the meeting tonight shall be done by roll call vote. Please note that there may be a delay between the time that something is said and when you hear it at home. Please be patient as we try and manage that delay. Uh, we ask that you not use the chat function unless you need to communicate that you're experiencing te technical difficulties. Uh, that goes for board members and participants uh, alike. Finally, note that this meeting is being recorded. It will be available on the city's website, lebanonnh.gov slash agenda center. And uh, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Tim. So I'm now going to proceed with a roll call. Uh, before that, I will just uh, mention we have two members, Matt Hall and Gregorio, who have recused themselves. And unfortunately, I regret to tell you that we have lost a board member, uh, Matt Cole. Uh, is not only leaving the board, but he's leaving Lebanon altogether to uh, seek a new job. And uh, I regret that because we were just getting to know him. So with that, I will ask each of you just to tell us whether you're in attendance and whether you're alone. This is Bruce Garland and I'm alone. Jim? Councillor Jim Winnie is present and alone. 
Thank you. And Joan? Uh, Joan Monroe is here for uh, Anne alone. Thank you. Laurel? Laurel is present and alone. Thank you. Kathy? Kathy is here and alone. Thank you. Sarah? Maybe Sarah's having muting problems. Um, and Tom. Tom is here and alone. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. This is David Brooks. Um, I believe uh, Gregorio Amaro is on the call. He is muted at the moment. All right, but he's still recused. Uh, I think he did last time. Yes, that's right. correct. Right. So. And Sarah, still, I spoke with Sarah. I know she's intending to be here, so uh, hopefully she'd be, be able to come into the meeting. All right, as Tim said, we are here solely to review this large project from Dartmouth College, but not to make any decisions this evening. Um, we've got a lot of material to go through, so let me outline the program that we're going to follow in order to do so. Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask the applicant to discuss five new plan sheets that were in, uh, included in the latest package that we got this week. I will then ask staff to make their comments. Thirdly, we'll go back to the review of the project that we started last time on 427 um, and just talk and answer questions that we may have. Uh, fourthly, I know at least one person did a site visit uh, between the last meeting and this meeting, so I'll give an opportunity for any member who did site visits to um, make known their observations to the members. Fifthly, we'll review the impact study, and I have to tell you that this one will take a little time just to explain to you where the bits and pieces are this is a little bit scattered in the documentation we have. So when we get there, um, I will go through that. And it includes one document that was also received um, in this week's package, or the, the package that we got last week, I guess. Um, so we'll go through all of those points. Sixthly, we'll talk about traffic. Seventh, we'll talk about the conditional use permit. Eight, we'll talk about waivers. Again, we're talking about these. We're not putting any of them to votes tonight. And ninthly, hopefully, we still have some time to open it to public comments and questions. So that is a long agenda um, before I ask the applicant uh, to start it off. Is, does anybody have any questions? All right, I'm not hearing anyone. Uh, so I'll ask the applicant to please review the five uh, site plans that are included in uh, this meeting's package. Sure. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Christina Vagan. Uh, I'm a vice president with the Michaels organization uh, here to present our presentation. Uh, just wanted to share who's present here from the development team. Besides myself, we have Daniel Justineski from Dartmouth College. We have Dave Benstemacher, Steve Hawk, Eric Bednarik, Jason Plorty from BHB, a civil engineer. We have Mark Moeller from JSA, the architect. We have Mark Fogary. He's from Fogary Planning, who did the fiscal impact analysis. And we also have Phil Hastings from CWB, who is our land use council. So we wanted to thank you for this special meeting and this opportunity to review um, the new submittal. So I'm going to hand this over to Dave Benstemacher from VHB. Thank you. Perhaps you could email that list to the planning board, the, the planning staff, unless they already have it, uh, for the benefit of our recording secretary. Sure. Um, I believe we have sent it over for the invitation, but we will send okay, it. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. All right. Uh, good evening, board. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Hi, it's uh, Dave Fenstermacher from VHB. So, Bruce, you have you went through an agenda. I think ours uh, lines up with it because I spoke to Tim. But just real quick, we're going to go through those new plans that we submitted, and then um, 
we'll walk through the other pieces as you lined out. I won't I won't double up on the presentation. Thank that. you. Um, but the, just to uh, focus on the new plans that we submitted, uh, I marked this one up a little bit, but um, some of the, the good feedback that we got was the concerns with the parking, um, particularly along the um, building two perimeter and the um, the ability to potentially there uh, enhance the landscaping buffer between the parking lot and the roadway. And then there was also conversations about, um, you know, our conditional use potentially banking parking versus building it all now. So the new plans I submitted, um, the LM plans, I think I did 3.0 and maybe 3.1 and 3.3. But this is an overview of the, the whole parking plan. And what we focused on was um, taking away the 25 spaces that were along um, Mount Support Road. And these were some where the headlights were would be a, uh, facing towards Mount Support. And then flipping those over to the Spine Road. Um, and really, the idea here is just to, to bank them. Uh, I think everyone's in agreement that we don't want to build all the spaces that we're looking for, but we also don't want to put um, the Michaels organization in a position where they can't lease rooms because there's not enough parking. So it's really the the focus of making sure we have enough parking, but balancing it with you know some of the concerns that the board and staff had related to the parking on the perimeter. So those landscape plans focused on that. We had some some blow ups. And I, I do I will say that we received comments already back um, related to the storage area being along that perimeter. And um, so what we've done, uh, we have comments, you know, from today even that what we're going to do is pull that um, snow storage out so that we don't have it along the frontage and we're going to update the landscaping plan to uh, we had some plantings down by the road, but we're going to take this time to bring some plants, add some plants too that are up at the the level of the the parking lot as well. So I'll, I'll have um, our landscape architect go through that when we get those. Oh, and here we are. So the other plans were the updated landscape plans, and I think what these focused on was previously uh, we were utilizing a lot of the existing trees, um, but what we did is uh, refocused our attention on planting some trees. And um, I'd like to introduce Eric Benarek, who is our landscape architect, to speak on this. Thanks, Dave. Uh, again, Eric Bednarik, uh, landscape architect with VHB. And so what we've done in, in replacement of those spaces that were removed, we are adding some uh, landscape uh, planting strips along the parking lot. And those would be primarily focused and designed so that we can also add snow there, but also locate the shrubs that are far enough away from the parking so that those plants won't necessarily um, get impacted by the snow and we'll also be smart about what type of plants we'll use uh, from uh, snow and herbal and getting a major <laughs> I think it's better now not don't know what's happening okay um, so we'll utilize uh, the right species in here um, that will be uh, durable for snow and salt management. And at the same time, try to focus on also providing plants that will minimize uh, impact for um, car lights and so forth and just the soft the parking lot as well. And that highlights that particular enhancement to the landscape. And then Eric, just want to talk a little bit about the uh, Eric, why don't you mute? Yeah, we're getting a lot of feedback, guys. All right. Yeah. That's I'll all. Just, I had, sorry, I had Eric mute. And then, yeah, just beyond that is the improvements to the, the landscaping along the whole frontage where we're planting and providing the calculations to show that we're providing the appropriate uh, permitted, perimeter landscaping as required. So I think it's going to give a nice um, corridor there as we come down Mount Support. Um, then the last one we want to talk about is the open space plan. I know before we had given some general ideas. Uh, this was something that um, the team went back to Dartmouth College and what we're showing here is 15% uh, of dedication. We're dedicating you know, portions of the wildlife corridor and really focusing in on, um, I know that the pond uh, that 
we people noticed on the, that site walk before and dedicating that area as well. So what we have here is, you know, eight acres of open space dedicated and um, I think this and this meets the 15% requirement at per the subdivisions requirements. So that's an overview of those spaces or of those sheets that were submitted in the last two weeks and I'll pass it back to you, Bruce. Thank you. Um, any questions from board members on these uh, five documents? Uh, this is Kathy. Yes, Kathy. I find it difficult in looking at these plans not to have the ponds and the streams that are up above the meadow actually outlined on the plans anywhere because they're significant. And all we kind of see are little dots and dashes for the extent of the wetlands, but they don't really point out where those actual bodies of water are. It would be helpful to see them. And then the second question would be in dedicating the open space, which says it's for active or passive recreation, it, it is actually a large part of it, the uh, wildlife corridor. And so I just had a question about whether identifying the wildlife corridor as open space was for the benefit of access of the public to get back into the property. Uh, is it harmful for the wildlife to have you know, access to that corridor for people. A little bit more information on that would be helpful. So this is Christina. This is Christina with Michaels. Um, the intent for dedicating that area for open space was for passive use. So the idea would be to restrict any future development activities. So the idea is it would be protecting the wildlife. It wouldn't be for access for the, the public to come tramps around in that area. But if it's passive recreation, wouldn't that be inviting people into that area? I, I don't believe that is the intent. The intent is to restrict development um, for many activities happening in that area. Mr. Chair? Right. Yes. Mr. Chair, Monroe here. Yes, Joan. I have related questions to this. Okay. Um, I, and my questions were, I was trying to understand, I, I understand about the quarter, and it shows on the map, I'm looking at the new information, I guess it's e, EXH1. It's the, the first one of the maps in our packet from tonight. Right, thank you. Correct. And And I understand about the corridor beginning at the road and then sort of going straight into um, the back part of the property. Um, and it's also going right along. Is it going along, along the existing tree line or is the tree line going to be moved farther to the south? Well, we wouldn't be Sorry. disturbing the tree line. The tr yeah, this is the tree line is set and is not moving. The, the tree line is pretty much up against the, the property line. Uh, okay. the, the rest is sort of that meadow out there. So that's what's going to be the majority of the, the open space. OK, um, and I real and I I'm I'm led to understand that that's connecting that this thin strip is connecting with a wider strip on the abutting property to the south yes okay and i i have the same concern that kathy just voiced in that that large area is sort of the only place where um people could could walk their dogs or uh in the winter maybe ski it it's it's a it's an awkward situation because ideally one doesn't want to have people in a place that that is being used by wildlife 
um, um, it, I, I guess I, I have the same concern that Kathy does and that sort of, I don't know how you'll designate that to the, to the residents. And it's not that, that they can go there, but it's the kind of thing where like you wouldn't want to have a badminton game there um, or, you know, or, uh, um, or any kinds of lawn games there on a regular basis. Um, I don't know if, if there's enough space within the four buildings. Is there enough space in there that that sort of thing would be done in the middle of the yeah. development? So a badminton game or a, a football game, that is an active use. And mm -hmm. we have areas that are programmed around the community building for that. And then you also have the open space between the buildings for that. Uh, we also have the bike trail um, that we're allowing to go through uh, from the mountain biking trail. So those are more active uses and okay. they'll be programmed for on the site. Okay. And what is what do you consider to be the the where is the the mountain bike trail? Uh, Dave, do you have one where it's more zoomed in? It kind of meanders just south of the internal wetland. Uh, he's pulling up one. It actually comes from the, I guess it's the east. Oh, yeah. the south as well. Yeah. The orange is the, the paths. Those are so, the orange on here is the mountain bike trails. I, I see, okay. So it's so, the existing trail. We're just continuing it and, and, and allowing the access through and we're going to improve it so it can continue to go where it was. Okay. I, I see it's using the existing woods roads that are in there. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yep. Got it. Um, and um, I was wondering why I, I realized that, you know, that your requirements are only 15%. But I was wondering, you know, why, I mean, why not, why not more? Why not include, include the whole wetland? I mean, surely it's not an area that would, would be, could be developed in the, in the future. Yeah, Phil, if you want to. Yes, this is uh, Philip Hastings with Cleveland Waters and Bass. Um, to uh, Mrs. Monroe, to, to answer your question on that, uh, what we're trying to provide is uh, a balance of providing dedicated open space uh, along with giving Dartmouth College an opportunity to um, address the open space, the additional open space in the context of a larger, their larger property holdings. Um, so we didn't want to necessarily tie that all up when there might be a more comprehensive plan coming down the road in the future. Um, so we wanted to meet the requirements. The other, um, the other aspect of that, even though there's not dedicated open space of more than 15%, Given the the wetlands and the other site constraints, there's effectively uh, a lot more. And uh, I can't read the the table, but the percentage is quite high of the area on this lot that effectively will remain open space because of the requirements uh, on it. The other thing I'd like to address, I think uh, Mrs. Romano was asking about the uh, access issue, and I I just wanted to note that in the um, in the, your subdivision regulations, it distinguishes between developed open space and undeveloped open space. Uh, it doesn't require any of it. It actually talks about taking into consideration the character of the land. Um, and the, your regulations also say that as a general principle, undeveloped open space should be left in its natural state. Uh, so that's what we're uh, proposing for the wildlife corridor portion. Uh, and just just to uh, Monroe again, just to to point out, I'm seeing on the, I think I'm seeing on on the map that you've added the buffer around the the wetland because that is is a prime wetland. Am I, is that correct? They, the, yeah, that, the, uh, that darker the dash line. Long, lines, the, long that's dash, the, short dash, long dash, that's, short dash. That's the, yeah, that's the 100 foot buffer. Okay. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm going to suggest so we move on to staff comments because I'm sure that we'll come back to some of these uh, questions when we get to the impact study uh, wildlife and light. So, um, if I could pass it back to David and Tim. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Tim Corwin with the Planning Department. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a quick question uh, before I get started. I know that we're going to return to the waiver re waiver requests uh, later on in the in the meeting. Do you want me to identify those so that we're thinking about them, or just save that the the, dis the discussion of all waiver requests until we get to it in the meeting? Well, let's save it, Tim. Good okay. question. Let's save it. Okay. Um, I I will make one point though on the uh, just just for clarification on the revised application for waivers, which was included with the agenda packet. Uh, the first two waiver requests are from 10.2 and 7.2. Those were already uh, uh, dealt with by the board at the initial meeting on this application. I think back in I think it was back in March. Uh, one was I think 10.2 was a waiver request from having to go through preliminary subdivision and the other was uh, from 7.2 the, the fees uh, which was which was that waiver was not granted. So um, that, that they're just in, if, in case you're you're keeping track of the number of uh, waiver requests identified in the staff memo versus the number that are uh, identified on the uh, on the application for waivers. There are two more on the application for, for waivers again because those were dealt with at a prior meeting. Um, just going to hit a couple highlights uh, in the staff memo. I think the applicant has has uh, already addressed many of the things that um, that I was going to talk about um, with respect to uh, the open space. Uh, they are proposing to cover 15 percent, uh, which is which is the minimum required under 12.2. Uh, as noted in the staff memo, we will uh, continue working with the applicant to ensure that the this area or whatever area is ultimately uh, decided upon uh, is is appropriately protected as is required under section uh, 12.2 D and E of the subdivision regulations. Uh, we imagine a set of, of deed restrictions uh, and we will continue to work with the with the applicant on developing those uh, as part of a condition of approval. Um, you can see that the, the related draft condition of approval uh, it's identified as number 22 uh, towards the rear of the staff memo. Uh, the applicant did uh, uh, there was some discussion just now about the uh, active uh, recreational areas uh, to be located within the confines of the development. Uh, there is a in particular there is a 30 foot by 60 foot active use area that's located to the rear of the clubhouse building. Uh, we would suggest that uh, that area be labeled more specifically as to its proposed use. Um, the uh, fiscal impact study will be discussed by the board later on the meeting, so I will skip over that for now. Um, section 12.5 of the subdivision regulations uh, uh, in, in addresses offsite improvements. At the moment, the only offsite improvement specifically related to this project or proposed for this project is a crosswalk uh, that will connect the, uh, the will connect the development site to the um, the multi-use path on the east side of Mount Support Road. Um, there is also, as noted by the applicant, uh, a sewer main that needs to be extended. Uh, north from roughly approximately where the uh, Timberwood development is uh, north to serve this development and the uh, the con conceptual development uh, that will be located across the road at 402 Mount Support Road. Uh, the app, the uh, developer for 402 Mount Support Road, the Braverman Company has obtained uh, approval from the council to extend the, the, the sewer main and uh, as, as has been noted, uh, the Braverman Company and Michaels are continuing to work on a an agreement as to um, who and who and when uh, who will build and when the uh, sewer extension will be built and and in uh, an agreement on how to apportion costs. <clears throat> um, a large topic, which um, I believe we'll get to separately later on in this meeting, is traffic. Uh, we have staff has been taking a very close look at. Uh, not just uh, Michael's uh, traffic impact study, but also going back and looking at the traffic studies for the DHMC Tower project, the um, 343 Mount Support Road project, uh, and as well as the 402 Mount Support Road project, the uh, Braverman Company was um, 
was kind enough to share uh, with staff the, uh, the the draft traffic study for for that development at 402 Mount Sport Road. So now that we have all the data, we've been combing through that uh, very carefully and uh, are, are arriving at some um, some proposed uh, ideas and, and, and numbers. Uh, and I think we will talk about talk about that more later on in the meeting. Um, it, related conditions of approval uh, with respect to traffic and traffic improvements can be found right now. They're identified as number 19 and 20 uh, located towards the end of the staff memo. Uh, finally, the applicant has engaged advanced transit in discussions on uh, where and when and how to construct a, a bus stop to serve the needs uh, at the residents of 401 Mount Support Road. Uh, we encourage those uh, those con the, those uh, discussions to continue and a uh, related draft condition of approval is currently identified as number 21 located towards the end of the staff memo. Uh, moving on to the site plan regulations, um, we, we as, as we just noted, we'll talk about waivers uh, later on, but I did want to just point out one at the moment. Uh, this is section 8.1 of the, of the site plan review regulations, which requires that uh, the applicant shall construct and complete all design and construction requirements prior to the issuance of the, of the certificate of occupancy. Uh, in this instance, uh, the applicant is proposing sort of a phase project. Phase one would include um, construction of the uh, clubhouse building to serve as a as a leasing office. That the, the construction of the clubhouse building, I believe, is uh, planned for uh, the summer of 2021, and there are a series of site improvements that. Are proposed to be constructed along with uh, the, uh, the the clubhouse building, and, and which will need to be completed in order to uh, obtain a temporary CO for the clubhouse. But um, because of because of the requirements of 8.1, a waiver is needed to allow uh, to allow the city to issue a temporary certificate of occupancy uh, for the um, uh, for the clubhouse prior to the completion of the rest of the improvements. Um, just moving along the um, with respect to the revised landscaping exhibit, I think it's the case that the uh, just just to clarify, I think it's the case that the landscaping exhibit that was shown tonight as part of the uh, PowerPoint presentation is an update from the planning exhibit that was in that was in, included with the agenda packet. Uh, and we are pleased to see that the uh, the snow storage has been removed from that area and that additional plannings are proposed. Um, I, I don't know if it's possible to include even more trees uh, than, than what is proposed, uh, but that may be uh, something that the applicant can consider. Uh, however, there is still need for snow storage. There was, I believe on, on the original plan, there, there was snow storage proposed for the, um, for the, for the parking that is is to a 90 degree angle of the landscaping strip that we're talking about, the southernmost area of parking. Uh, maybe there's uh, 10, or, 10 or so spots there. I think that was designated as snow storage and it doesn't appear to be any longer. Uh, but even even then, even at that point, it, it, there, there was some concern, staff had some concerns that Again, even then, there wasn't sufficient, necessarily sufficient uh, snow storage throughout the site. So, so I think snow storage does remain an issue. It's not something that we want to see uh, at the front of the lot, uh, but but um, but it sh we should look at opportunities for for placing it elsewhere. Um, Staff would recommend um, staff would re recommend that the lighting uh, plan be revised to ensure that there is no spillage, if you will, uh, uh, from the the southern edge of the parking lot into the wildlife corridor. Um, just moving on to the conditional use permit to allow access parking. Uh, the as as uh, as the applicant noted the. Maximum number of, of parking spaces permitted by right, if you will, are is is 556. Uh, 557 are being are, are proposed at this time to be, con be to be constructed. Uh, in addition, the uh, 25 parking spaces that are now reserved for future development uh, along the, the the spine of the interior access road, uh, those those do require a conditional use permit. Uh, to allow uh, to allow more than 120% of the minimum parking. Uh, spaces uh, to do to, to grant that conditional use permit uh, to allow approximately 125% of the minimum required. 
uh, the planning board must look at section 3073B2 of the zoning ordinance, uh, which sets forth the, the applicable criteria uh, A through D. Um, when we when it comes to uh, when it comes time to discuss the merits of the conditional use permit request, uh, be happy to uh, walk you through those criteria and answer any questions uh, that you have about that. Um, as I noted, the city engineer did uh, shared staff concern about um, needing needing additional snow storage areas, and I'll let um, I'll let Brian chime in if he has uh, has anything else that he wanted to to specifically discuss tonight. Uh, the last thing I wanted to go over was just um, <clears throat> on page thirteen of staff memo A deliberation, just to get everyone's mind clear about where we're headed. Um, in this instance, there there are five decisions that need to be need to be made once the public hearing is closed, which again we don't expect to occur uh, until the the June eighth planning board meeting. But once the public hearing is is uh, closed, the board has to do five things. Uh, that first they have to first you have to determine whether the development is scattered and premature. Uh, which is a, uh, a requirement under section 10.3C 10 10 of the subdivision regulations. And we can, it might be useful at that point to, to specifically read into the record that the language of 10.3C, of just so it's clear what we're, what we're referring to and discussing. Um, number two, uh, the board will have to determine uh, whether or not to grant the requested waivers from the subdivision regulations. Uh, three, the board will have to determine whether or not to grant the waivers from the site plan regulations. Number four, uh, the board will have to make a determination on the conditional use permit to allow access parking. And then finally, uh, you'll have to make a decision on uh, granting the subdivision and site plan requests. Um, at the moment, there are 31 or 32 uh, conditions of approval, uh, draft conditions of appro appro approval. Excuse me, if you have any questions about any of them, I'm, I'm more than happy to ask. I would point out very quickly that um, proposed condition number 25 is redundant of um, of condition number 21, so you can you can ignore 25. That will that will be excised. And uh, I think that's all I had for now. Brian, did you did you have anything that you wanted to add? Uh, hello, this is Brian Vincent. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, just a couple things. I had some comments about the grading around the interior wetland. It looked like some of the pavement was actually lower than the, the existing wetland in terms of elevation. So that's something that I'd like to discuss or, or determine if that's if my view of that is correct. Um, and then I had some comments about the drainage analysis. I was looking for some catch basin grate capacity calculations. Um, and lastly, I was looking for some more detail on sub drainage design systems for the buildings and any kind of sub drainage for the proposed parking and uh, access roads. So Brian, uh, I take it you'd be looking for responses in the coming days, not this evening. Correct, yes. Okay, fine. Can I take a brief pause here and just, uh, Sarah, have you joined the conversation? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So you have. Okay. I ha I'm on the phone, but That's luckily fine. my com com my new computer is able to. It can't it can't pick up my voice, but apparently it can pick up the slides. I see a staff uh, comment okay. and general question. Is that right? That's is yeah. that where you are? Correct. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, uh, anything else from staff? No, I, I don't. David, this is Tim. Did you have anything that you wanted to add, David Brooks? No, I think you've covered it adequately. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to move Chair, to a Chair, Chair, uh, Chair yes. Garland. Chair Garland, yeah. I have a quick question. This is Monroe. Yes, Joan. Um, what we were just talking about, what Mr. Vincent was just talking about, um, if I read his comments correctly, he and he was talking about about the uh, the difference in in height of the land for near the southern entrance and I thought that I saw in the comments that it said near the wetland and so I was wondering where that wetland was I don't see anything on on any of the maps that show any kind of a wetland near that south entrance was he talking about the central wetland no, um, I, I thought that 
I thought that Mr. Vincent in his comments was talking about the the southern entrance, you know, the emergency entrance to Mount Support Road. This Maybe I misunderstood it. I don't think so. Maybe I misunderstood it. Chair, could Brian can um, yes. clarify that? Brian, are you there? This is Brian. Brian. Um, yeah, I was talking about the central wetland. Um, oh. I believe it was the south side of that wetland. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. So uh, I think we've exhausted staff comments. So now I'm going to move on to the third item on the agenda that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, continue our general discussion of the project and make sure that we all have a full understanding. I'm going to kick off because I went through it and realized now maybe there are things that I missed, uh, but there are clearly things that I don't have answers to. So first of all, just at a very high level, is this development required to meet an expansion of Dartmouth's graduate program, or is these people who are currently housed somewhere on campus that will be moving to this new site? Daniel, are you available to answer that question? Sorry, this is Christina. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. So uh, Dartmouth currently has uh, under under supply of graduate housing. So this is to meet the existing demand. Okay, so this is the uh, um, current students. Um, and then I did a recap. Uh, so the proposal is obviously four buildings, one with 81 units and one with the three with 76 units. Um, and those translate into 638 called sometimes in your documentation bedroom, sometimes beds. We can talk a little more about that. But then I realized I don't know what a unit means. And then I went to the plans and unless I'm missing something, I couldn't find any floor plans. So I don't know, are there elevators in these buildings? Are there sprinkler systems? What yeah. do the units look like? Yes, I can um, answer that. Um, okay. This, this is Christina with Michaels, um, the applicant. So yes, there are elevators in these buildings. Um, as you say, there are four buildings. One of the buildings has um, the ground floor, uh, building number two, that is uh, adjacent to the clubhouse. Um, that has additional units because it has that additional floor. Um, the difference between beds and bedrooms um, is it's pretty interchangeable. Uh, student housing is usually provided furnished and it's also leased by the bed or bedroom. So what this means is um, a tenant will lease and they will get their own bedroom and they have their own individual lock and either people can come with roommates who will lease another bedroom and say a two bedroom unit and they will share a living room and a kitchen or we will do roommate matching for them. So say you're a graduate student who's starting and doesn't know anybody else, we'll do a roommate matching situation for them. So the typologies for the apartment types that we have are one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and four bedrooms. So the four bedroom units provide the most affordable option where it's four bedrooms, it'll be four individuals, and there are two, bed, two bathrooms in there. So four individuals will live together. They will share two bathrooms and they will share a kitchen and a living room. So that's the difference between sort of a unit and the bedroom and the you know, bed. So would it be possible to get floor plans? Sure. For the next one? Sure. Yeah. I think that would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, so I presume, how many of the one bedroom are available? Um, I can give that to you. I, should, um, it's, I would say the majority of the units are two bedroom units, and then um, there's one bedrooms and there's four bedroom units. So I'd say it's probably about 60% two bedrooms and then like 20 to 30% one bedrooms and 20 to 30% four bedroom units. So, so the exact breakdown. So the, 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 what I'm getting at is children. So the two bedroom units 
um, would be uh, something that a couple with children might consider? Um, typically, because these are student housing units, they are going to be leased to two uh, unrelated individuals. So we'll be leasing them by the bedroom. So it would typically be two adults. Correct. But if, if there's a married couple and they want to have two bedrooms, they could use one bedroom for themselves and another bedroom for a child. Yeah, the bedroom. then that way they would have two leases, but um, that's standardly uh, not uh, the focus of the student housing leasing market. Um, okay, there's, there's nothing that excludes that. It, there's nothing that excludes that, um, but the way the agreement works with um, Dartmouth College, uh, the way we market our units to graduate uh, students, they get priority. Um, so it won't exclude them, but it won't be targeted towards um, uh, families. Understood. Um, and then my last question, does the, the rental uh, include parking or is parking to be offered separately at a, an additional price? The rent does include surface parking. So it is included uh, and it would be, you know, first come first serve. Okay, so that was my follow-up question. So the rental includes surface parking that we assigned or not assigned? Not assigned. Not assigned, just first. And, and presumably parking for one car. You wouldn't have somebody renting a bedroom that somehow shows up with three cars. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, that's pretty obvious, but I had to ask. And then I had a question. I went on the Dartmouth website with parking and transportation, and it wasn't terribly helpful in that it says all community, commuting uh, brackets living off campus. Students are required to register their vehicles, contact the parking office to see your, if your address is in a commuting zone. So would this building be in a commuting zone? So the plan um, with this site particularly is to accommodate transportation to the college through the private shuttle. So what we are doing here is as part of our operations, uh, we will be providing a shuttle for our residents to leave their cars here at their apartments and then they would take the shuttle into Hanover to go to classes. So the idea would be they wouldn't be driving their cars into downtown Hanover. I, I understand, I appreciate, but does that prevent them from getting, from phoning the office and saying, uh, I need a parking place? Um, Is there I, anything in, in the re rental agreement that stipulates that there are no parking, there's no parking available at the college? Yeah, that is my understanding, and I can defer to Dan on that. But just like there is a dearth of available housing for graduate students, there's also a dearth of available parking in downtown Hanover. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question related to parking? I'm sorry, is that Kathy? No, this is Laurel Stavis. Laurel. Thank you. Um, are the vehicles that may be owned by the students who live in these apartments Will they be registered in the city of Lebanon? Um, I would assume that uh, the way the laws in New Hampshire work is if you are living in New Hampshire uh, for a certain amount of months, you have to register at your address um, and you know your state of residence. So um, these are gonna be annual leases. So I would assume that they would have to be registered um, with the city of Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. All right, that was my list of questions. Now I'll open it up to other members. Mr. Chairman, this is Dan Justinski from Dartmouth College. In, in yes, that question, I didn't want to step on, on, on your asking the question. The intent with this, the original RFP Sorry. was to propose developments such that the applicants that, that uh, reside at this new development will not be issued a, a, an, an everyday permit to park at Dartmouth. There could be that emergency where somebody would have to drive into town. The expectation is on that rare occasion, they are, are paying for a parking spot, not through the, the Dartmouth side of things. 
uh, everything will be uh, in the communication such that it is the rarity for a, a tenant of this development to drive into Hanover. Um, and, and that would be articulated. Related to that too is the question about families. As you know, we have another small project in, in Lebanon. And um, as we market the spaces to our prospective graduate students, pushing the families to go to the family friendly, friendly Sachem village um, and, the, and the younger single applicants to go to the Mount support side should keep the, the mix, uh, should keep that separated such that we don't run into the, the family situation going into Mount support. There are uh, 270 units at Sachem and, and we are accommodating of the family environments there. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll be coming back to this, this question when we get to the uh, impact study. So this is very helpful in uh, setting that up. Yes, Other sir. board members with question, general questions on, on the project. Bruce, Sarah Welsh here. Yes, Sarah. I just want a clarification. I have a number of questions about the waivers. We, uh, I was a bit confused by what Mr. Corwin said. We will be going through the extensive staff memo and yes. we'll get to the, the waivers for both site uh, regulations. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, That's, you missed my announcement of our program tonight, but yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Any, any other questions? regarding just the overall project. If not, I'll move oh, on. Here, this is Kathy. Kathy. I have a number of questions and concerns. Chief among them are three. The first one deals with a statement that was made. Um, I think it's in the April 20th letter that says undergraduate students are not eligible to lease at the property. So my question is, will Dartmouth or Michaels accept a condition prohibiting undergraduates as lessees? So there are certain rules uh, for fair housing where we cannot preclude, um, you know, students are not technically a protected class. So we can't, you know, they're not protected in that we can't preclude them, we can't exclude them. Um, the way we're setting up our agreements with the college uh, and the way sort of our, our ground lease is working, we're having a um, marketing waterfall, which basically prioritizes who uh, is getting leased these apartments. So the uh, first group of people who are eligible to lease these apartments will be the graduate students. So they have a certain time frame um, for the pre-leasing. So it's to- no, I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but we yeah. have a lot of things to cover tonight and I understand that. I'm My impression of protected classes is that if age were a protective class, you could not exclude them, but because it isn't, you actually could exclude them if you were willing to. So is that something that the city is interested in? I'm not speaking for the city. I, I'm okay. a board member and I have a question. As, and, and you can think about it and get back to us if you wish. But I was just um, interested in knowing whether you would be amenable to that condition. The second concern that I have, uh, I walked to the site for almost two and a half hours. And um, I'm the granddaughter of a farmer. I've walked a lot of farm fields in my younger years, including some on stream and river sides. And I have never walked a site that was so squishy, muddy and wet as this one. And I, I was amazed when I actually got up near the top of the site at the, the large size of the pond and the streams that the kind of serpentine we're winding through that area. And I know that water flows downward. So as we proceed, I will have a lot of questions relating to how that stormwater is going to be handled. And uh, someone at a previous meeting um, mentioned dewatering the site. I would like to learn more about what you mean by that. Uh, and it kind of, um, 
dovetails into another concern that I've heard voiced by a number of people, and that is the um, amount of parking that's required for those 309 units puts a lot of asphalt on a very wet site. And there are only two ways to cure that. One is to have a lesser number of units. And the other is to put the parking someplace else. So um, I have a couple of questions and again, don't have to answer them tonight, but to think about them. I know you said at a previous meeting that you couldn't put parking garages in the basement because of the high water table. And I understand that. But Elmwood Gardens and uh, another project that's supposedly coming online on Spencer Street in Lebanon are, have parking on the first level above ground or at ground level, which would basically take maybe I'm trying to figure out 19 units out of building three and another 19 out of building four, and that would reduce the amount of asphalt you'd needed. Or I saw a comment in, I think it was the April 27th minutes that said, no stone walls will be removed from the site. But that, that can't be correct because all the diagrams that you've given us show stone walls going right through building three. And obviously, if you're going to build that building there, the stone walls will be removed and it's very wet to the south side of those stone walls. If you eliminated building three, you'd be taking out 76 units and you would you could really increase your space for snow storage and reduce the number of parking spaces you needed and you'd still have 230 270 units um, i'm sure you don't have 638 unhoused graduate students currently um, and you could put quite a few of them in 250 units so just thoughts that i had to reduce the asphalt coverage and to give you more space for um, activities and to uh, handle a very wet site. We appreciate your comments. Um, I'll start with saying we do have um, market studies that show we do have um, that many graduate students that are currently unhoused are also living in areas where they're paying a significant amount of money uh, towards their rent. Um, one of the reasons that we can't do this as structured parking or parking under the building is because of the cost of construction. Um, I mentioned this during the last meeting on April 27th. Uh, one of the driving principles for this project is that these new units will be leased at the current graduate housing rents that are being paid at Sachem Village and at North Park, which is another graduate housing location in Hanover. Um, so uh, our, our, our sort of standing mantra is to maintain an affordability for the students. So in doing so, um, we've had to balance sort of the cost of construction against um, the affordability of the rents. So it's, it's kind of a, a tipping point that we've been um, functioning. Um, the wetness of the soils has to do with the type of the soil that is in the topsoil. So it's the, so it's, I think it's the, the, the two inches below grade to the five inches, it's a glacial fill. So it has a problem in which that it doesn't drain. So uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're exporting that um, offsite to deal with that condition. And we are also dealing uh, with the water condition by doing um, the on-site uh, stormwater retention, which uh, we've provided a significant detail um, that's located underneath the parking. Uh, for building one and uh, building two, and we could provide more information on that. But that's how we're dealing with um, the wetness of the soils. Bruce, so uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Tom. Yes. Uh, I'm going to bring up the same issue that I did last uh, meeting with the other project, the other large uh, housing project that's going to be built on the same, uh, same avenue, and that is we're in a time right now of a uh, uh, coronavirus that is causing all kinds of things, including colleges and universities like the uh, University of California State System declaring that they're probably going to go to uh, no classroom activities except for laboratories and a few uh, engineering classes for this fall. So 
we're seeing a lot of colleges and universities that are not going to be fully open this fall. Now, I understand that the first building, which is the clubhouse, doesn't come online until 2021. And then I, I guess the first question is, when do they see this project coming online? And in the design that they're doing, is there a way that they are going to be able to have, assuming that we don't have a, uh, a, a uh, uh, some means of protection through either an antibody for this or uh, some means of uh, treatment, uh, how are they going to do social distancing and how are they going, uh, will the designs be everybody coming into indoor corridors accessing their rooms or are there going to be multiple entrances and exits for people from their own uh, uh, units exterior as opposed to interior? Uh, I, I think these are the kinds of things that we're going to have to be looking at. Do we are 300 and 400 people in a unit in a, a building going to be feasible going forward? And the other aspect of that is if people are afraid to use mass transit, they're going to use their own cars. And if they do use their own cars, I noticed in uh, a previous document from Hanover uh, talking about the concerns of traffic uh, into Hanover for the students who are going to be using their own cars. I, these are the kinds of questions that I think have to be looked at going forward. Uh, you know, we've had a number of outbreaks of various different things all the way back from the 1960, uh, 1916 polio epidemics to the Spanish flu in, in 1918 to the Ebola in, uh, uh, you know, in the spring of uh, 2013 through 16, and then now the coronavirus. These kinds of epidemics aren't going to be getting becoming less. We're going to see more of these. And so we're going to see, I think, pressures on how are we going to do social distancing and how are we going to be able to protect ourselves. Um, and I'm just not sold that large concentrations of people are the way that uh, the way of the, of the future. Anyway, that's my comment. I guess I would I would like to see how they would be addressing um, this and how it would impact their own projects. So, uh, so first, um, yeah. yeah, to answer your question, um, the plan is to deliver this um, these apartment buildings in the uh, August of 2022. So it would be for the academic year um, of 22. Um, the other thing, uh, so each of the four buildings have two entrances. They come in um, on each side of the elbow. Um, so that's how they would be entered. Um, you would, I would assume, if there was another issue, you would shelter in place, just like you're sheltering in place for the epidemic now. Um, uh, I'll hint again that um, we are building this housing um, in the most affordable approach as we can in order to provide housing units for people who currently can't afford um, to rent in older buildings that are probably of poor quality. Um, so that's what I can comment, um, you know, the cost of new construction um, is very expensive um, and we can't build single family houses or townhouses um, and be able to have them afford rent. So it's unfortunately a push and pull um, that happens in, in multifamily development. So what we are doing is we have, you know, we're having green building um, approaches that we're doing. We have very clean mechanical systems that are going to have clean air. Um, they have their own individual mechanical systems, so they're not recirculating air that's shared with other units. Um, so that's what's going to be encompassed in the design of the buildings. Mr. Chair, I have a this is Laurel David. Have a yes, Laurel. Um, this is a question directed both at Michaels and at Dartmouth. My understanding is that Dartmouth owns the land and is executing a contractual agreement with Michaels, which will then be responsible for putting up the buildings and renting them and maintaining them and doing everything that has to be done with those buildings. And Dartmouth has a hands-off um, position with that. 
um, which is markedly different from other types of Dartmouth housing. Is that is that an accurate statement? Um, I, I can comment. Um, it is not like what they have on campus or within, you know, right in downtown Dartmouth. I mean, I'm sorry, in downtown Hanover. Um, they are still involved in that our business agreement with them has certain things that we need to adhere to. So they're not hands off per se. Um, we're working together as we operate um, for things like leasing and managing and guidelines. There are rules that we need to adhere to um, to meet the Dartmouth College, you know, what they expect um, for their housing. So it's not necessarily hands off. The question remains. What is the entity that will have the ongoing day-to-day -day responsibility for the management of this, these buildings? That is the Michaels, um, that is Michaels Student Living Management Company. Um, so that is correct. So we were procured to do the management. We currently manage housing um, both on campus and off campus throughout the country. Um, the Michaels company has been around since the early 70s uh, managing housing. So Yes, I understand that. I, I wonder, uh, Mr. Chair and other members of the board and staff, if it might be appropriate for the planning board to have a copy of the agreement between Dartmouth and Michaels. I'll defer to staff on, on that issue. Um, this is Tim. I, uh, I, I don't know that that's something I, the the board can ask, but I don't know that it's something that the applicant is, is required to disclose. They're, they're not standardly public record. Um, both are not public entities. It's not a state school. Um, yeah, this is this is David <laughs> Brooks. I, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Corwin's comment that, again, I think you could ask, uh, but I don't think there's anything in your regulations that would allow you or, or require them to to make that public understood mr chair yes Sarah Welsh here. yes sir i just wanted to clarify something that that occurred to me when tom uh was talking tom uh mess was talking um can i ask uh is it karen i'm sorry who is the kv on my screen it's christina vegan Forgive me, Christina. I, that's the problem of having problems connecting here. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Christina, my question is this. These are not bedrooms or rooms, whether they are two or four, in which two beds and two people will be in the same room. Is that correct? That is correct. So they are not. Okay. That would be doubly occupied. These are single occupancy beds. That's what I, that's what I gathered from all the materials I've seen. That's Therefore... Um, there are going to have to be, by the time you open up in August, God willing, in August of 2022, there are going to have to be uh, from some agency, whether it's the college or the state or the, the federal government, some ability for people to be able to be in a connected apartment but sleeping separately and therefore less, you know, 50 percent of one's uh, exercise uh, as, as a breathing human being will be done in the privacy of your own room. And my second point to confirm that this is a good idea is I was a graduate student. And I was a rather stupid graduate student. It took me five years to get my master's degree, mostly because I didn't go to class very often. But the, my point is this. If I had not first had my own apartment and later my study in whatever house or apartment I lived with once I got married, I would not have ever finished that degree. And therefore, the acknowledgement that scholars sometimes don't get a carol of any quietness in the library and might just want to go back to their, their bedroom to study is a very positive thing on the part of Michaels. And I do think that that will also be something, a form of sequestering that will actually be potentially good uh, two years from now. So I did want to say that while I acknowledge that Tom has certain uh, things to be concerned about, I don't believe it's the place for us to take any more time on this because the single bed rooms will go a great deal towards allowing people who don't want to be sitting around with other people to go into a place that they can deny another person to come into. 
No, you can't come into my bedroom. I'm going to sleep now. Thank you. Thank you. And, and to, you, to the point is they actually have their own locks, their own leases. So they even better. Mm -hmm. Even better. Thank you. Mr. All right, Chairman. Do we have any other questions or comments on the project overall before I move on to site visit? Mr. Chairman, this is yes, David, David Brooks. Yes. Um, I just wanted to um, provide a clarification on a comment that Ms. Romano made about the um, alluding to the fair housing rules. The state of New Hampshire has its own uh, housing discrimination laws, which do include age as a protected class. Uh, so although it's not in the Federal Fair Housing Act, it is part of the state's laws um, that prevent or prohibit uh, discrimination on the basis of age. So again, I think um, I had a back and forth with, uh, with a, a member of the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority um, who wrote the article on um, <clears throat> on fair housing in New Hampshire several years ago. Um, and he said, basically, it is Dartmouth's uh, obligation to comply with the regulations unless the city um, imposes a condition um, that which would put the city in the uh, legal line of fire, so to speak. So that's uh, that's just a clarification I wanted to provide for the board. All right, thank you for that, David. Yes, Kathy. Yes, Kathy. Um, another um, comment in the staff memo number 32, there's a statement that says property owner is responsible for maintenance of stormwater management system. And that follows up kind of on Laurel's question. You know, is it Dartmouth? Is it Michael's? Like, I, I think as we go along, rather than saying things like, property owner, we might just say property owner slash Dartmouth, or, you know, we might really um, clarify exactly who we're referring to, because this is an, a unique partnership. We might be assuming that someone is responsible for it when they're assuming that someone else is. I, I think we ought to be clear. Hi, this is uh, David Fenstermarker, and just to clarify too this is subject to the NHDES uh, alteration of terrain permit and as part of that as part of the permit there will be a name and contact given and at this point that is Michael's so we can clarify it but I just wanted to let you know that um, the state is also making sure that there's someone identified for this maintenance great thank you All right, um, I'm going to move on to item number four, which was um, anyone who has made a site visit um, since the last meeting. Kathy, you mentioned that you've been on. Do you have any other observations to share with the board? I think I would just reiterate the ones that I made previously. Again, looking at these diagrams and seeing all those little dots and dashes up near the wetland, I'd really like to see an outline of this, the actual streams that are running and the ponds, because when I look at the larger site plan, I can't tell where they are. And uh, again, the concerns about how wet that soil is. All right, thank you for that, Kathy. Do we have any other board member who's done a site visit and would like to share? Chair Garland, <clears throat> Monroe here. Yes, Joan. Um, about I have comments about my visit. Um, that was good information, and I appreciate um, the answers to why the ground there was so squishy and what will be done about it, because that was a concern of mine and a somewhat surprise um, because it, it was we were past mud season and it. It, it just I didn't. OK, so thank you for that. As far as the wetlands go, um, I was very su surprised that the wetland that's in the very center of the four buildings was considered a wetland because um, 
there, there for me, there was almost no indication of water there at all. And I know that one doesn't necessarily see water 365 days to make it be a wetland. But on the other hand, um, it just, I couldn't figure out like where the water might be coming from or not coming from to make that wetland. And I was trying to understand why there were two stone walls on either side of it. So, so that's a wetland question that is there, there's someone um, other, I, I know that wetland scientists are engaged to do this, but it's just, it, it just, it's just very different than the many, many, many that I've seen over the years. Um, and so I was, I, I can't, I, 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 I'm at a loss to, to believe that that really is a wetland there. Um, so are, are any of the, the staff so, able to answer? Hi, well, this is Dave Fenstermarker. I can share, um, I know we submitted, I'm not sure if you have a, a record of it, but we have the report from our wetland scientist. And this was something that was also picked up in the past by another wetland scientist and we confirmed it. And it's really just a forested wetland and it is from, I'm not the wetland scientist, so I, I'll share this with you and I can have them on the, um, pull together a response, but it's really based on um, the groundwater and not streams feeding it. And it's, I think it's more of what the soil profile is in the, the uh, vegetation there versus being a wet land. So we're keeping the forested land, the forest, uh, the trees in that area to maintain the wetland, and it will still be grabbing uh, the water from the groundwater based on the soil that's there. But um, it's been confirmed and that's one that we sh we shared this report with uh, the DES Wetland Bureau as well and they were uh, in agreement on that so uh, but I'll g I won't pretend I'm a wetland scientist beyond that but I wanted to let you know that there has been a report and discussions with the state on this piece uh, because I in in visiting it I was almost wondering um, you know looking at the other wetland where there's a pond and there's obviously trickles of water and the pond looks looks like it seemed very obvious to me that it was a um, a beaver dam that had created that pond um, and they're, and they're pretty good little critters indicative of wetlands that's what they love to do is find a wet area and dam it up and make make a couple of nice homes for themselves um, but and so I, I I almost was feeling like the one in the middle seemed maybe not you know, n not crucial and keeping, and and in perhaps by not having that one, um, the building could be moved farther away. Um, on to the north and south of that wetland, there are there are indications on on our on the maps that we've had, and you could see it on the ground that it that indeed that there's a whole a whole line of water that's going across the property from almost exactly north straight through the back the back part of the property to the south and that and including that nice pond so um i i just to me that that part of the property is the, the really valuable part and it does look to me that building and i think it's four is four the one that's in the the, the northwest corner yes okay uh, it's this one here. Yeah. yes it seemed to me that number four really was encroaching um or uh, coming extremely close to that wet area that is marked on on all of our our paperwork as that the parking lot is like right up against the wetland and that the current wooded area that makes a very nice buffer will be completely taken down and the pavement will go completely up to the edge of that that buffer um i mean it, it won't be a buffer it'll go right up to the edge of of the wetland and that that concerns me um a lot and so i i also am concerned with with how much the buildings are going into that into that area and not just the buildings, but but the the pavement. Um, and I think it might have been Ms. Romano who was talking about the n amount of parking spaces. And I wonder if is if there was any chance at all that that 
that area, the, the parking area that's to the south of building four and then to the west of building four and then to the northeast of building four might possibly have become um, porous pavement and then seem like that might help keep that, that wetland alive. That's because as soon as water is not allowed to get into a wetland, that's the death of the wetland. And it, it is marked on your on your maps. And there are actually, I, I guess what, what you could, I would call is like puddles that showed that there was water there probably a lot of the year. Whereas that one in the middle, I mean, I only saw a couple, and I accept that it's a forested wetland, um, but it, to me, a wetland that's most valuable is a wetland that has water because most of the uh, animals that use it, they're there for the water. Um, so just a, an, an idea, if the buildings can't, if four can't be moved farther away, can there be por porous pavement put in there? And if you're going to be removing the soil there, the soil that's there now that doesn't drain, perhaps the soil that replaces it would drain better. Comment, response? Again, I think we'll we'll take your comments into account, and uh, we'll share those concerns with the wetland scientists and get their feedback. Um, but they'll they'll be the ones who'll be able to to respond better to the the feeding of the wetlands and the the nature of the wetlands. Okay, thank you. But but I will say that that center wetland again was something that was delineated, and I think DES might have gone out there. So that's that's a protected wetland by the state. So in okay. terms of um, encroaching on that, that's probably yeah, we, not going to happen. We can't disturb that. Chair? Yep. Yes? This is Kathy again. When I was out there walking, I would, and it's hard to really identify exactly where that center wetland is. So I was going by the location of the stone walls that are, I think they're on this figure, those light lavender lines there, flanking that wet central wetland area yep. and it just seemed to me that the the ground was actually wetter to the south of that wall than it was yeah. to the north it seems strange but that's the way it seemed when we were out there there certainly was a lot of mud this is monroe that was outside of that forested wetland and and right at the beginning of the the woods roads of course, there was um, there was already major disturbance of the stone walls there, obviously to get the heavy equipment uh, far enough in to the forest to be able to make those um, test borings. There were, there were already a lot of trees newly torn down. And like I say, the, the stone wall had been broken to allow the machinery to get to get in. And, and that area was very wet and muddy. All right, thank you for those comments. Um, I have, um, Chair Garland, I had one other question um, okay. about, uh, from the site walk. Yes, please and, go ahead. Okay, Monroe again. And it's the house that's on the neighboring property to the north. Um, it looks to me, I didn't walk all the way over, but it's fairly easy to see over there. And especially before the trees leafed out, that the property, the house on the property to the north, is very, very close to the northern property line for this parcel. Um, and so I, I'm concerned whenever I see um, abutters who have been living years with just vegetation close to them, I'm always concerned when this amount of traffic and headlights um, and parking is seemed to me to be going to be very, very close um, to the abutters. So I was concerned and hoping I, I would have to look at the, the new um, landscaping plan again to see if there were any, any vegetation or anything that's planned in that area to, to help shield that house that's there to the north. <clears throat> Councillor Monroe, this is Dan Justinski again from Dartmouth College. Dartmouth College Real Estate Office does operate that home 
as part of our, our graduate and staff housing when we have an applicant that is, is looking for a small single family. Um, so it, it is a Dartmouth College operated property. Okay. And the, the trees that are there on that northern border are within the setback and those are, are going <clears> to <throat> remain as they do okay. today. Um, so so at, at trying to inject a tiny bit of humor, does that mean that future renters of that house now with 307 units ne right next door and you know 500 or 600 people are they going to get a break in rent because suddenly they're not living in the country anymore good luck rent. with that one <laughs> the the interesting thing it goes towards that the the long-term uh zoning regulations in the city and you know the intent of the of, of the city to bring more mixed use as you go around the corner on on la Haye, um the 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 use for the single family residents uh is our current use of it, but in, over the long term, over the next uh, two decades, you could see as as you go around that road, there, the potential for future work that would not have a small single family home right there. Uh, but for now, it, it is a, a well-loved house and um, we have occupants that uh, when it becomes available immediately do lease it. Thank you for your reply. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Just a quick note on this, this is the landscape architect. I just wanted to let you know that our buffer requirement extends around that corner as well, about 190 feet. It's uh, shown in our calculations. So there will be proposed plant material that does extend around that corner to uh, existing vegetation to remain. Good. Thank you for that. All right, I think we're done with site visit observations. I'll pause for a second. All right, so I'm now gonna move on to impact study. This, I guarantee you will find very confusing. So bear with me because I am going to take this from the perspective of the rule and try to walk you through what in the documents we uh, received correspond to the various sections. So section B1 is wetlands and other nature related issues. There's a discussion on page three of the VHB letter of 21020. Plus there is a two page uh, addition in our last um, packet uh, that Tim provided on wildlife. So I'm gonna okay. go through the at the end of Sarah, at the end, it's in color. So I'm going to go through each of these just to show you how scattered this is, and then we'll come back and deal with each one individually. Uh, two is school capacity, and that is dealt with in the latest uh, submission uh, entitled uh, Fiscal Impact. Uh, three, streets, that's obviously not applicable. Four is utilities. And that's page four of the VHB letter of 21020. Five is sewage. Six is public safety. And that is in fiscal study item six, the, the first fiscal study that we received. Seven is drainage. And that is on page four of the VHB letter of, again, February 10th, 20. And then Fiscal impact is the uh, combination of the two studies, the one that we received in the uh, previous packet, and then the update that was included. So as I say, it's rather scattered. Uh, what I'm going to suggest is we go through item by item. If you don't know what I'm referring to, call out and we'll help you find it. Can you enlarge it at all? Well, this is... Uh, Michael's impact study. So I'm not quite sure. I've not seen this, and I'm not sure where it's going to follow in the same manner. So perhaps I should ask Michael's if you could follow through. Let's. Where where do you have wetlands and nature that corresponds to? 
uh, 12-3B1, which is a statement of impact of the proposed development on natural resources, environmental quality, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I would say that's a combination of um, sections of our drainage report and our, we do have the NHDS wetlands application and um, the, the permit for that. So maybe that's just something that, um, Bruce, for your guys' benefit, just get into one compiled document, but that's that's how we've addressed it. It's just not an assisting uh, response. Although it was, I agree with it, it would be helpful to the board if we had it all in one place. Um, but there is half a page on your 210 letter uh, on page three that deals with wetlands. Yeah. And since that time, we've just, there's been more um, investigation and materials pulled together. That we have received or not received? You have received. It's in the, the drainage report. Uh, it's probably, it's in the, um, the application materials. So, Tim, can you help? Where would I certainly didn't find that? The, <clears throat> the drainage report. Well, which one's this talking about? Um, this is this is wetlands, or, wetlands, and wildlife corridors, and the like. Or this was, you know, it should have been submitted as part of our um, presentation to the Conservation Commission. It's the cop. Sorry, yeah, we did submit a copy of the wetlands permit application, and that that should be on the record. That it has all that material. Mr. Chair, this is uh, this is Tim Corwin. Perhaps yes, Tim. Um, perhaps the applicant should submit um, a document explaining exactly where everything is located, and to the extent that items haven't been adequately addressed um, that that document does so. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that all of the information that's required by uh, B1 has been submitted in, in writing to the planning board as it as it should be. For example, for example, it, you know, information on air quality. I don't, I don't, I don't remember seeing that anywhere, but I could have missed it. All right, so so I, I agree with you. I was trying to pull together information that I could find. Um, so let's let's go through the rest of it and see if there are any other pieces that we would ask the applicant to provide by the next meeting. Uh, Chair Garland. Yes. This is Monroe. Um, yes. One thing that we have not really gotten, but I've always felt would be very helpful is if we could get, say, the minutes from the Conservation Commission's review reviews. Um, what we've gotten in the past has usually been an extremely short, like a paragraph, a really greatly condensing their discussion. And I mean, like whether members went on site walks, what they saw on site walks, the Conservation Commission does have, as I, I know a number of the people who are on it, and they they do have a quite a lot of a lot of actual um, professional expertise, plus people who, as serious hobbies, have studied a lot of the aspects of um, the environment. So it's um, that the fact that we don't have. I'm looking at the February 10 letter, but that one's coming from the the applicant, and right. and I I always feel I'm missing something if I don't hear what the discussion of the Conservation Commission had, and I, and their findings. Uh, yeah, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. There's a letter. The chair Garland. There, there is. But it is always extremely short compared to their discussion and I don't find out whether they've gone and seen it, you know, if they've done site walks. But the, the, the Conservation Commission is in this instance, Conservation Commission review in this instance, sorry, this is Tim Corwin, um, was required because of the wetland impact. Is that is that correct, Dave? 
fence across. Yes, we were going. In, we went in for a minimal uh, impact and presented the application for um, a pr for sign off from the Conservation Commission, and they had comments which they um, submitted. I thought I saw it as one of the past staff packages. Right. I mean, we can certainly provide those minutes, but that's not something that we would re routinely do for an application that's unrelated to the application before you. Uh, Chair Garland? Yes. This is Ernst Oitman. I, I am in the I'm public. sorry, who's this? Ernst Oitman. Uh, Chair, sorry, you're in the public. You're, you're going to have to wait until we get to the public uh, comment portion of this meeting. I'm also the Chair, Chair of the Conservation Chair. Committee. Chair, Chair Garland? Yes. Um, I am looking at the letter from Mr. Oitman um, and dated March 13th, and he is he is the chair. So um, perhaps we can allow him to speak or to review the the, the, the the comments that were in the letter. Just a request. I agree. I'm, David, I'm not sure I can open up the public hearing to just one person. I mean, I'll be happy to include him when we get to the public hearing later in this meeting. Okay. So let's hold that, but I think we have a consensus that the board would appreciate having a consent document addressing this part of the regulation. We don't have that at the moment. Uh, so the second item is school capacity. Um, we have a new document that addresses it, uh, which frankly, it, and this is no criticism, it's simply a mathematical study that makes sense, but somewhat contradicts the debate we had earlier on as to whether there will be married, or not married, but there will be couples with children in these buildings. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the document that was submitted? This is in our most recent package as part of the fiscal study. Chair, we have the consultant available um, if you would like him to review anything, um, especially uh, why a second report was provided. No, I... I I appreciate the second report. I was the one that asked for it, and I was very happy to see that he was able to reach out to people from the school board and put together information. And frankly, from my perspective, it's as good a guess as to whether there'll be children going to Lebanon schools from this development or not, uh, for reasons that we debated here. So I'm just asking, do board members have, have questions on that? two page, page and a half document. All right, I'm going to move on. Chair. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Winnie, sorry. Um, yes. I've, I've got the document popped up. Um, my question was related to, just finding a line, it was on, um, there's a miscellaneous line of 15,000 under municipal costs, and I was curious what falls under that. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark Fougier, the consultant. Um, it's really a catch-all for any other department that may uh, receive some sort of impact. The, the metrics I used um, for this report, um, where there is basically measurable uh, demand for services that I could find with police, fire, and schools. If you start looking at other departments uh, in the city, uh, it falls off pretty quickly. Um, so it's sort of to catch any other departments that may uh, feel some impacts that we're not aware of or could be in the future. So it's it's a catch-all. All right. So things like road maintenance and you know wear and tear and stuff would fall under that. Yes, off-site obviously. Uh, On-site would pay for by the applicant. Zero. Yeah, I'm just thinking there's going to be a lot more traffic up and down Mount Support as a result of this and other yeah. projects. So, or wear and tear on the roads, etc. And and does is ambulance impact under fire? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Chair Garland. Yes. Monroe again. Yes, um, 
I'm looking at the 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 two pages that were in our packet for tonight, and I see that that um, uh, Mr. Fugier has gotten slightly you know more updated information, um, and I see that it says that enrollment has declined by 33 students at the Hanover Street Elementary School, but I I would I would have to say um, um, that it just seems to me just using straight common sense that with the number of, of housing projects that we have approved and some of them filled up very quickly and others of them are taking longer to fill up, but I just feel that that it's inevitable that there will be more children in the schools and the schools will stop seeing the decline in, in numbers because if we had, if I had a table right in front of me um, that listed the numbers of projects that we have, and keeping in mind that um, one issue that we have been made aware of is that often divorced parents are take a two-bedroom apartment and will be one parent with the children, and the children will then go to the go to that school, and so. Even though apartments are smaller and they're not made for for children, um, people will do, live however tight and, and close they have to to be able to have advantage of their kids going to, to school. And as a school system in, in Lebanon is regarded very highly, um, especially with with children with special needs and um, and we just have it's just a huge amount of employees at the hospital, and we're and they're going to be increasing as we have the new, the new tower, the new patient tower. So I I know I'm seeing the statistics in front of me, but I think common sense tells me, the schools will will again they will grow again bigger. But Thank but you. the issue here is to what extent will that growth come from this project, and this project is estimating 10 to 15. Uh, but the school board suggested a higher number of 17 to 20, which translated into an estimate of two additional teachers and $200,000 a year. That sounds to me to be pretty large, given the context of this particular project. But I would also this say that we, as, if, I, if I may just go a step farther, that we as a planning board cannot look at these projects as if they were completely isolated with nothing um, else happening. And that's kind of what happens with our, our traffic reports. Each traffic report for many of these large projects concludes by saying, this will not have a big impact on the local, on, on the local intersections. However, as I've stated before, 100 cars or 99 cars from this project and 99 cars from that project and 99 cars from that project, all being built within the same one, two, three, four year period does add up to- Correct, and that, that's percentage. why we're gonna be treating traffic separately and differently. But I don't see any way that we can tie school, cost of school into development across the city. Well, hopefully the impact fees will help cover that. Mr. Chair, this is Laurel Davis. I have a question. Yeah. Yes, Laurel. Um, what is the uh, gross local property tax revenue based on? This is a question, I guess, for either Dartmouth or Michaels, and, and therein lies the problem. It's tough to know who to ask. Well, um, Mark could comment on how this is estimated. Um, it's typically based on the approved value uh, once the project is completed. Um, so he, he can hint on that. Um, and that's estimated uh, based on mostly the cost of construction and the income approach. Mark, do you want to detail that? Well, you, you just answered it. So, that, I mean, we, we looked at some internal documents that Michael had as far as their estimated cost of construction. Um, and the due diligence they did when they went forward with this project, and, and that's where we came up with the value, the estimated value of the development. And Laurel, to answer your question somewhat differently, we've never been successful as a board and city in having 
the city appraiser review a number or numbers provided by an applicant to give an opinion as to the re reasonableness of those numbers. That's not what I was That's asking, though. Well, um, you were asking where the number correct numbers come from, and I'm saying suggesting. we're getting them from the applicant, but we don't have any separate review by the city as to whether those are reasonable. Right. So this is this is based on what we think the property will be worth um, upon completion. Obviously, the tax assessor, as as the chair alludes, will have his own opinion, um, and the property will be assessed once it's completed. But it's based on your. Can, I, can I answer your question? I have a follow up question. Please. Which which goes back to the point that the points that Tom raised a few minutes ago. And that is a little bit hard to put this into words, but we are in a completely different fiscal environment now in the city of Lebanon and surrounding communities. Um, we are looking at deep, deep holes in our municipal budgets um, that probably we will not be able to climb out of for several years. We are talking about retrenching services, laying people off. When this fiscal impact summary was done, I assume it was done before or the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. Is that correct? Uh, when we first started it, uh, we gave some impact uh, calculations that were based on your administrative code that aren't currently captured in here. Um, when we first did the fiscal impact analysis, it was the beginning of the onset of COVID, which is why we had some challenges getting data from the school board. Um, so it was the beginning of COVID. So the, the answer is that it, they weren't done in the context of the current situation. Well, they well this data that's provided right here was done in the context. So we asked the questions of the school board and they provided the response that gave the amount of kids they expected in this environment of COVID about a month ago. Thank you. You're welcome. And also, as you'll see in this fiscal finding, this just talks about the um, to uh, property tax. This does not talk about the impact fees that we're paying one time. This is not talking about the sewer fees. This isn't the full picture of impact fees um, that are being paid from this project. Chair? Yes. This is Kathy. Is that Kathy? I know if we look at this as a, a an outline of a budget, I know lots of times when budgets are made, you always forget things, little things that, you know, have an impact on the bottom line. So a couple of things um, in the staff memo in 12.2, it says deed restrictions will be placed over the open space with enforcement vested in the city of Lebanon. So there's another cost to the city that enforcement of things that's not police enforcement. That's someone in the city has to be responsible for keeping track of things. And I noticed in, in uh, another document that we have that was talking about the riprap uh, entrance to the open space for the um, wildlife corridor. It referenced a uh, fence that needed to be removed at Timberwood. And it's like, it's been four years. Why, why hasn't that been removed? That's another one of these enforcement issues. Like, is anybody doing it? Do we have the staff to do it? So that's a concern. And then there's been a great deal of, of uh, emphasis put on using bikes instead of cars. And, you know, whether you go to Hanover, whether you go to down to, um, I'm hearing comments that aren't very friendly. Um, the, um, lost my train of thought, sorry. Uh, the um, Colburn Park. We need bike racks and other improvements in the city. So I think there probably are expenses that, you know, are going to be expenses for the city or for someone that, that maybe aren't accounted for here. Okay, fair point. All right, I'm going to move on um, to utilities. 
So streets obviously um, are not applicable. Utilities are reviewed in the February 10th letter on page four. Um, and my read is that that's pretty straightforward, largely because uh, the project will be hooking up to city water and sewage. Does anyone have any questions on that half page? All right, number five uh, is sewage, which is not applicable uh, for the reasons I just gave you. Um, number six is public safety. I know you're hot, I'm asking you to hop around a lot, but this was covered in the original fiscal study as item number six. Um, and the applicant and their consultant reached out to uh, senior members of fire and police and uh, I'm asking do people have comments or questions on that section of the fiscal study. It was listed as municipal service cost but it talks about the number of calls and so on and so forth. I guess another way of framing my question is are there concerns about public safety um, related to this project. Chair, it's Kathy again. Yes, Kathy. I think the same comments we had as we made last week with regard to the 343 Mount Support Road, uh, the crosswalks and the safety and the possibility of having those push button blinking uh, signs so that um, traffic would be alerted that someone was crossing the street. I believe that that's covered in staff comments. I saw it somewhere. Tim, can you just confirm? Uh, I get the I get the two projects confused. I think I did mention. I think we do. I think we do mention something along those lines in the somewhere in that's the staff. What I thought. But we can um, we can add that to the conditions of approval. All right, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to, I know I'm dragging you all over the place. Um, drainage, there is a brief comment and, and perhaps before we get back to other materials um, that we don't have handy, but in the 220 letter, again on page four, there is a paragraph that talks about stormwater management. But Tim, am I correct to say that this is sort of like the wetlands portion. It's something that we should ask the applicant to pull together for us. Well, well, no, I think I think it would be it, it, I think it would be appropriate to ask the applicant tonight about that. It's not it's not necessarily a wetland issue. It's how does the how does the how does the drainage function on site? All right, let's do that. I agree. So I'll turn that over to the applicant. Yeah. Hi, it's uh, Dave Fenstermacher again. And just a, an overview of the drainage. I mean, it's all in the drainage report. The drainage report was reviewed by a peer reviewer. Um, we have additional comments from Brian Vincent. Um, but the overall intent of the drainage is to um, provide curbing along the, the, uh, the, the paved areas of the site to collecting uh, stormwater through catch basins to a series of uh, closed pipe drainage systems, which ultimately brings it to these uh, the subsurface filter systems, which provide detention and treatment, and then um, that will provide quality and quantity control. This has all been re submitted to the, uh, DES for their alteration of terrain uh, permit application. Um, they've had some uh, minor comments, but we're we'll be updating our plans and our uh, study to reflect that and that will be sent back to Brian as well as we implement his changes. But overall, it's the um, mitigate. We're, we're mitigating everything on site through the use of these um, sort of uh, large underground treatment structures. Brian, do you have any comments to add to that? I think Brian in the chat said he lost his audio. Unfortunately. 
Yeah, I, I'm sorry. This is David Brooks. Brian was uh, he was going to try to hang up and dial back in, perhaps, uh, because yeah, as as was just mentioned, he couldn't hear. That's unfortunate. We lost Tim. Um, Tim or David, I'm putting you on the spot. I know, but do we wait until the next meeting for Brian to comment on the drainage portion? Are you aware of anything that concern at this point in time? Let me put it that way that the board should be aware of. I, I think his comments, I, I don't know, but I I, uh, I know he has submitted comments to, to uh, on the project as a whole. Uh, I don't know where he stands specifically with respect to the drainage study. Uh, so I'm right. sorry, I, I, I don't have an answer. No, that's, fine. that's fair. So in any event, we'll be coming back to that at the next meeting just to wrap up. Chair, this is Kathy. Yes. yes, Kathy. Could we ask the applicant um, two things? I know the city has spent multi-millions of dollars in separating their old sewer system so that the stormwater is separate. Where is this stormwater that's collected from this site ultimately being discharged? Is it through a separate stormwater piping system and where does that lead? Yeah, it's yeah. not connected to the sewer system at all. It will flow along um, some swales on the west side of um, Mount Support and it culverts to the other side and then um, there's a larger wetland area I think just west of 120 that's over there. So nothing get nothing's in the piped system with the city. And the, the sewer is going to be in a, a new extension for for the sewer discharge. Thank you. Yep. All right. I think we've gone as far as we can on that. Uh, and then the last part of this uh, requirement is the fiscal impact, which I believe we've already discussed unless somebody else has a question or comment on it. All right, I'm going to close the discussion about the impact study, um, noting that we need to revisit uh, item B1 at our next meeting. And now I will turn it over, I guess, to staff to start the discussion on traffic. David. Uh, it is it is unfortunate that uh, we've lost Mr. Vincent. Um, yes, so as Tim mentioned earlier in the meeting, uh, we do now have the traffic studies for all four projects, uh, even though one of them hasn't submitted a formal application yet. So we have been able to um, extract the data relative to the Mount Support LaHaye Drive intersection. And we've been taking a very close look at that, that particular intersection and how these four projects impact it. Um, we've been looking at uh, what is the traffic today? What is each project? You know, what is the background growth anticipated to be from uh, just both from other projects that have already been approved in the vicinity, as well as just general background growth uh, of traffic over time. And then what is each project uh, expected to generate and add to this particular intersection, both in AM and PM. Uh, and I believe as Mr. Plourd has pointed out um, on behalf of the applicant, none of these projects by themselves sort of trip any triggers but when you add them all up together uh, they definitely do add uh, as much as 25 or more percent of, tr of trips through that one particular intersection uh, so it is very much i think it is very appropriate um, to continue to work with the applicants uh, and the city to arrive at some improvements that might be appropriate for that LaHaye Drive and Mount, and, uh, Mount Support Road intersection. Um, and we're, we're still putting together and, and crunching the numbers as to exactly the, uh, the trip generation and the relative share 
uh, of each project in terms of trips through that intersection and then what the city's going to be responsible for, um, given that the intersection uh, is in a is in a near failing com position right now. It's uh, it's a level of service E at the moment. Um, so we are we're continuing to work on that. That the, the on a, as a side note, the city's capital improvement uh, project budgeting project process has begun, um, and submissions have been made relative to this particular intersection. Um, with the idea that uh, these these applicants will be helping to contribute towards that project. And I believe, I, I hope uh, Mr. Vincent is back on and may be able to add uh, to that discussion. Chair, this is Brian. Can you hear me? Yes. Glad okay, to have I am back. back Brian. Yeah. The, the only amendment I would make to David's comments is the AM uh, current intersection. The AM is a C, not an E. The PM is an E. So, uh, in summary, this sounds like it will go on for a while. It may be that there is no, um, nothing specific that we can act on uh, should we get to the point of deciding on this application in our next meeting. Is that a fair statement? Uh, again, this is David. I, I hope not. I would like to think as we crunch the numbers and, and then get back in touch with the applicants, we would be able to um, arrive at a at a percentage to which each applicant is responsible and, and be able to provide that to the board. But you'd also need to provide that to council, wouldn't you? To, to the that the city is going to be on the hook for part of it? Uh, not um I, I don't want to put you on yeah, spot here. yeah anticipate right so so we don't know where we'll stand all right but this is moving ahead so board members do you have questions for staff in regard to this issue chair garland all right yes Mon yes monroe here Jordan. um it's uh, tra two traffic things, not necessarily related to the report, but traffic. Um, I found in our staff memorandum the reference to the uh, flashing pedestrian crossing beacons. And it's in our, our memo, uh, the packet that was sent out for tonight's meeting, May 18. It's on page 7 of 18, and it's on the very bottom of the page in 13.13 .13, pedestrian walks and bicycle paths. So that was, that is something that um, uh, I certainly support and I hope that, uh, that other board members also support it. And the other uh, issue that's related occurred to me about not having uh, in this proposal, not having uh, sidewalks proposed for the for the west side of Mount Support, and uh, my question would be that um, that it's that in the same way that we look at the capacities of the roads, I'm thinking about the capacity of the sidewalk, and as, as I occasionally go up Mount Support these days in the time of isolation, I'm seeing that the the sidewalk that's on the east side is being used by uh, 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 mothers with children and strollers, um, joggers, and pet walkers. And um, I'm I've I've seen out in in Oregon where they I've been going out there visiting family for uh, 16 years now, and I see how they indeed have made sidewalks to nowhere that now when I go out, they are connecting up. And so I am thinking that 
we should be doing the same thing. We should be making each of the projects on the east side of, of Mount Support also make sidewalks that would seem for now to be going nowhere, but at the rate we're having applications come in for Mount Support, it's not gonna take terribly long before our little, our little row of dominoes is gonna add up. So um, that's just an idea that it occurred to me while I was reading about the traffic and thinking, well, but there's pedestrian traffic as well. That's my idea. Thank you for that, Joan. All right, I think we've closed out traffic. Uh, obviously, a lot more to come. So now, um, fortunately, we seem to be moving well ahead with our agenda. Uh, now I'm going to ask Tim to review the uh, conditional use permit discussion, uh, which is on page 13, page 12 of the um, staff memorandum that we received for this meeting. Uh, now, again, we're not making any decisions, just want to go through it, make sure everybody is clear as to what is at stake here and have an opportunity to ask any questions. Tim, may I turn it over to you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just point out that, again, the criteria that the planning board needs to evaluate um, in, in determining whether or not to grant 125% uh, of the amount of minimum required parking instead of or in addition to the 120 percent maximum that's permitted without any sort of special approval uh, the criteria the board needs to focus on is is found in 6073b 2 a through d of the zoning ordinance and it's it's uh, copied and pasted into the staff memo on on page 12. Um, I would say D is is not in a, is not applicable here. It's more of a a, a prohibition against uh, against permitting anything any amount of parking that exceeds 150 percent of the minimum requirement. Um, that's not that doesn't apply here. 125 percent is what's requested. Uh, but it's the other three criteria that the, that the board will have to um, will have to look at and determine whether or not the applicant has has met uh, the bur their burden in satisfying that criteria. They have uh, addressed uh, 6073B2 in a letter that was uh, provided with their original submission dated February 10th, 2020. So um, when we go to vote on this, uh, presumably in our June meeting, uh, will we need to vote on each of these points or just on the overall request? I, I would I would suggest just the overall request. All right, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be clear. Do I have questions from the board members? All right, I'm going to take that as no, and that this request for conditional use permit is clear in its intent and how we need to decide on it at the next meeting. And then a much longer, just because there are many more of them, um, section is waiver request. Again, Tim, I don't know if you want to handle this as subdivision regulations first and side afterwards. Oh, I got to do this. Somebody's got their uh, microphone on that you might not want to. So we're hearing sighs and other whispers, but it's up to you. Tim, are you back with me? Sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I would, um, I, I would just recommend that we, we ask the applicant to quickly walk us through the application for waivers. So, for the subdivision or the site, the, the, in in the application, uh, the the, app, the four page application that was included with the staff memorandum for, for tonight's agenda packet, um, they go in order uh, as as they appear in the staff memo. Subdivision regulations first. Uh, then the site plan review regulations. All right, does everybody have, so this is the city of Lebanon applications for waivers document, correct, Tim? Exactly, yes. All right, so could I ask the applicant to walk us through, now 
section 10.2 we've dealt with and 7.2, right? So we can skip the first two? Correct. Yeah, we should, we should be on 10.4.8. Right. So we're on page eight. two of two. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll go over these quickly. And again, I, I think we've, th through the other projects we've worked on, these are more like partial <laughs> um, waivers versus, you know, full waivers, but this really has to relate to the size of the project and then the additional 200 feet beyond our project and just the overall scope of um, those items and just really focusing on the items that are related to the project and what we'd be connecting to in the roadway. So 10.4 A1G, um, so that relates to the location of existing structures, roads, easements, and trails located on the property and within 200 feet of the property. So um, we're showing all the existing structures on, um, within the site. Um, there are no easements, but the roads, we're showing Mount Support Road and the trails. But what we don't do is we don't carry the trails 200 feet into um, you know, the, the, the surrounding properties. Um, we are significantly cut far back from those back property lines as they are. So, you know, we're not even within 200 feet of the additional 200 feet that's required. So we're just looking to uh, limit for the purposes of the subdivision plan, um, what we're showing for structures and trails and roads within 200 feet of the property. And I think uh, if it makes sense, I'll just run through these first three because they're all really related. Um, and then H relates to existing natural features, uh, permanent intermittent water courses, marshes, lakes, uh, floodplains, wetlands, outcrops, all within 200 feet of the property. Um, and the plan shall indicate approximate limits of clearing for the development and those natural features that are to be removed, retained, and altered. So what we do, we show what's going to get removed, we show the limits, we show what's um, getting retained, but we don't do is carry the 200 feet beyond our property into the uh, to the west and then um, for i and the same one this one relates to existing water and wastewater mains culverts and drains uh, within 200 feet so we do show the important ones that we're tying into and we're showing the mount support all along our frontage it's just the the 200 feet in either direction so those are kind of grouped together with you know we're showing a significant amount of uh, information on these plans already and we're dealing with you know um, maybe a third of the site or a quarter of the site that we're actually developing and just trying to limit the amount of information beyond the two beyond the prop 200 feet beyond the property line for that all right um, can i just stop you there again yep. board members the the point this evening is not to make a decision but to go through the debate questions whatever so that at the next meeting we can go through these uh, in terms of decision making in a very ex expedited manner. So does anybody have questions on these three or criticism, comments, whatever? Yeah. So this is Tom. Yes, Tom. Uh, yeah, I do have, I, I guess it's a question and maybe actually uh, to David, David and Tim, but <clears throat> You know, I understand why the applicant would want to have waivers on these because they're 200 feet outside of their property. On the other hand, if uh, if we have a requirement that the, this is done on others, why would we not have this also done on them? I guess I'm having a hard time understanding why we would give a waiver to something that the city requires on properties that are being developed, especially if these are large properties like the one that's being proposed. What would make that different than somebody else, you know, applicant B uh, wanting to build a property and, and they would have to do a 200, uh, you know, the, the uh, utilities and the other things that are within 200 feet of their property. So David or Tim, why? Well, I, this is Tim. I, the, um, the the why is is dependent <coughs> on whether or not, or I, I should say, whether or not the board grants a waiver depends on whether the board feels that 
the requirements in seven section 7.1 a or b have been met and so any any aspect of the subdivision regulations can be waived um upon or uh, uh sorry we're, we're doing uh we're doing subdivision at the moment um, any aspect of the subdivision regulations can be waived uh, upon request of the applicant uh, provided that they can uh, demonstrate uh, that they've met the applicable criteria. Um, and so that's up to the board to decide whether or not there is uh, unnecessary hardship uh, under uh, criteria A uh, or whether uh, there is there are um, specific circumstances uh, relative to the particular proposal that indicate that the waiver will properly carry out the spirit and intent of the regulations. So that's that's the general answer to the question. Um, there are, it, in other words, there are specific criteria that have to be met. It's not just a, an arbitrary, it's not supposed to be an arbitrary decision of the planning board. It's supposed to be based on whether or not one or two of those waiver criteria have been satisfied. Um, uh, these criteria in particular, um, are, are it's not uncommon for applicants uh, to request waivers from those requirements. If 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 there's a if there's a feeling among the board members that that's important information to have that that uh, is you know would weigh upon your your analysis or evaluation of the, of, of the overall overall request, then by all means it can be uh, it it. it probably shouldn't be granted uh, unless again otherwise the the applicant has demonstrated uh, compliance with uh, one of those waiver criteria so I, I i'm not sure i'm directly specifically answering your question i'm giving you more generalities but um i i, I don't know david brooks did, did you have anything to add yes the i think that was a very good answer i think the generally speaking the regulations are written to cover any possible application in any part of the community um, and they they are generally designed to make sure that the board has enough information to make an informed decision however there may be specific instances for any given application uh, for which some piece of information isn't really critical to to whether you can make an informed decision uh, you know, what might be within 200 feet of the west side of this property, for example, for instance, um, may or may not be relevant because they're not they're not going that far west with their proposed project. Um, and so what might be over there within a couple of hundred feet may or may not be relevant. Those are the kinds of those are the kinds of uh, decisions that you have to make. Uh, again, Tim, Tim cited the section that they can they can ask for any waiver, almost any waiver uh, of the regulations, but they need to justify why they're asking. And if the board agrees and, and doesn't feel that, that some piece of information is is essential to your review and to your understanding of how the property fits in its neighborhood, uh, then you you may feel uh, able to grant that. And if you feel otherwise, then you sh you shouldn't vote to to approve it. OK, well, let me let me give one point that uh, as you've been explaining this and as I've been thinking about it further, uh, I wonder how this would fit in. So earlier in the discussion, we were hearing about groundwater and the way in which the groundwater would be removed from the site and it would be funneled through uh, new stormwater drains that would go from what I understood, under mound support over to the, uh, what would be, I guess, the east side of the, um, of the road and down the way to a, a, um, a wetlands area that was a large wetlands area. If we, I, now I personally didn't know that that's the way they were going to be taking care of the groundwater situation and that that would be flowing into a wetlands. And I'm wondering what the impact of that wetlands is from the groundwater that's being uh, taken off of this, uh, this particular site. So if I didn't, if, if they weren't required to show the wetlands around that area, I don't know that any of the rest of us would have, except perhaps Joan, who knows where almost all wetlands throughout the, the city are located. Uh, that that would be the case. And so I'm trying to figure out 
if we exempt somebody from regulations that are there, how we can be sure that we have all the information that we need to know that we're making a proper decision on, um, on granting the approval of these. Files. Somebody's printer is making noise. I can't hear. No, that's my old computer that's starting to oh. wheeze. We call her wheezy. I apologize for that. I'll go back on mute now that I've had my say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Chair? Yes, Zach Kathy. When I read the first um, waiver request, it lists easements, trails, et cetera, located on the property and within 200 feet of the property. Those are two different things. And as you read through all the others, those little ellipses in there leave out the on the property and just put the end of the sentence within 200 feet of the property. And I think with regard to some of these requests, we wouldn't want to waive depicting them on the property. We might be willing to consider, for some of them anyway, waiving their uh, showing up within 200 feet of the property. But I had previously requested showing ponds and trails uh, on the property. And since a lot of emphasis has been put on the fact that people could be using these trails to access the hospital, I think showing the trails within 200 feet of the property is, is not an uh, outrageous request because the applicant has stressed their importance. So I'm, I would like to see, I know the general outline of the wetlands is, is depicted, but I would like to see where the pond is and where the trails are. Um, and I understand Tom's request for um, the way the water is traveling to the Eastern wetlands. Um, I must admit that I, Miss the point about on the property. I was focused on the 200 feet. But you see, it, it, it is part of the waiver request. It's just not written in each of the requests. But it, it's assumed to be there, right? It is assumed. Yes, I was certainly. I mean, that's what the that three little dots yeah. mean. It means something's missing, and it's on the property that's missing, I think. And that's, yeah, sorry, this is Dave Fenstermark again. That's, that's how I, I hope to. Um, communicate that when we started this is that we do have all the information on the 54 acres. We have the ponds, we have the the wetlands, we have the trails. Um, we and that's why there's a little there's a little gray area here. We're only looking for the waiver request for the pieces that, you know, as David mentioned, if we're 200 feet from our property line, showing something to the west 200 feet um, doesn't really um, impact the the review of this area, or if we're, you know, hundreds of feet, thousands of feet from the western one, showing something 200 feet beyond that. Um, Except perhaps uh, in in one person's um, opinion, the wetlands, and and I'm saying with the trails, it would would be helpful. But I, I think Kathy and Tom were looking for different maps, one that shows the connection into the trails and how you get to the hospital. Um, and two, this whole issue of stormwater and the wetlands that they will be going into, which came up tonight. All right, again, we're not here to decide on this. I'm gonna ask that we continue with this review. Um, can the applicant go back to the next. Uh, Chair Garland. Yeah. Chair Garland. Yes. Monroe here. Yep. Monroe here. Um, I just wanted to add that um, that in my mind, 200 feet is not an excessive amount at all to look at beyond the property. Um, the in, ter in terms of wildlife travel, in terms of water, 
the distance that water travels, um, that that 200 feet is a, is a really small amount. It, it seems minimal. And the according to the wildlife corridors um, study that was done, it was recommended that the width of the wildlife corridor should be 375 feet. So I would like to see from the distance from the buildings on the southern boundary and the, the constructions, meaning the the um, pavement, I'd like to I would like to see what was 200 feet beyond um, the area, you know, what's beyond the the um, the area where the border is. So uh, and the same for the trails. I'd like to see how far to the west it takes before you connect to the north south trail. And I, I also think that it's an extremely good point about the large wetland that's to the east. It's the one that you see when you drive in on, I always forget which one it is, whether it's Lehar or the, the northern entrance, um, where you see, the, you know, and, and that wetland goes basically parallel all along Route 120. Um, and it, it, some of it is clearly of uh, excellent high quality wetlands. So I think 200 feet is a small amount to ask for. But I would suggest that we need, we need a discussion on that subject with a map that shows how the two uh, connect. The 200 feet won't get you there. Right. But I would think that um, it would, I would think there would, might be a note somewhere on the on the in uh, somewhere in the information that that reveals that because that's a really important piece to know where you know where the drainage is going does it right. cross on the braverman property does it cross through timberwood does it you know it would we should know where all that water is correct no, I, I agree i agree but that's well beyond the 200 feet so but the 200 feet gives us the start. We, didn't, we didn't finish up on drainage tonight Okay. We need okay. to come back to that. So please okay. take a note. All right. I'm just going to keep moving on because we're not making a decision tonight. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Hearing, Mr. Hearing Mr. Chair. Yes, Tim. Mr. Chair, this is Tim. Thank you. Um, I, I do think it's it's a little tricky. I, th I think the to the extent that the board members would like additional information and I think this is what's what you've been discussing. But if the, if there's specific specific information that you would like with respect to these waiver requests prior to the next meeting, that that should be made as clear as possible to the applicant tonight, so that they can provide that information to you. Um, some of it, some of the information that you may need could possibly be made a condition of approval. Um, uh, but again, to the extent that you need it before making a decision, we should try and make that as clear as possible to the applicant. I, I think that um, it, we, you aren't making a decision tonight. On the other hand, um, with some of these, if, if you were, if there was consensus that it, it's, it's not something the board is inclined to grant, I, I think you could, I, I think that should be made clear too to the applicants so that they can respond appropriately it, to, to the extent that it's possible. Well, I, I hear you, but we've got half an hour left, and I'm desperate to get to the public. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the applicant yep. to take notes of two more maps that I don't think we have. One is a map that details the connection into the trails, and two is a map that shows the discharge into the uh, wetland. I think that that would help the board enormously. Chair Garland, do we need a straw vote vote or is that adequate? I think that's adequate. I'm just asking, I'm sure that the applicant will wish to get their waivers approved and will therefore be motivated to respond to this. Does anybody else have a request for an additional map? All right, so let's move on to the next three. Chair Chair Garland? Yes. I, in considering how long it, it takes us to do these, and we're not going to decide tonight, is there any chance that we can move to the public? I don't know when we last heard the public. 
Well, that's why I want to go through these really quickly now. I'll, I'll be quick. Thank you. OK, um, so this is Dave again, because these other ones are paired together to um, 10 4 C2 A and C2 B. And again, this is not a waiver that we don't want to do something. It is that it requires the cost estimates for the offsite improvements. And at this point, um, still negotiating with uh, AT and still working with DPW on the appropriate crossings and bus shelter locations. We just don't have those plans. We just don't have the final design for those to give a cost estimate for. But if there was a condition that we could provide those once they're, they're agreed upon um, or whatever, whatever um, we need to, if there's a, what's the word I'm looking for? Some sort of escrow or something that's needed. That's something we can talk about in the conditions, but for the purposes of this, we're just asking for a waiver to provide that at this point, the, the two cost estimates. Fair enough. Okay. Um, and then the site plan ones, I'll, again, we won't get into details because this is very similar to the subdivision plans and really relates to the, you know, within 200 feet. Um, the first three are all related to the 200 feet. Um, the other one is if we're using the existing trees and we're using a large mass of trees, the regulations require that we need to measure, field measure um, a certain amount of them within 25 feet of the disturbed area where, you know, we're more than meeting the perimeter landscaping. So. I'm just looking to a waiver to provide this. I think this would be, you know, more appropriate if someone's using one or two trees to supplement a plan versus us being surrounded by um, the woods. Um, but we can we can discuss that. Um, and then as we move on the parking area where the landscape shall have a minimum eight foot width. Um, setting the low the row of the parking spaces with deciduous trees for shade. Um, what we did is we wanted to really minimize the impacts and so we've 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 not provided that uh, buffer but we've provided that buffer on the perimeter and then supplemented instead of the the eight feet length we've provided you know sufficient islands to provide the, the appropriate shading um, and then it sounds like the sidewalks along the frontage is something that um, we'll provide a response to anyway based on um, Ms. Monroe's previous comments. The uh, fire access, this is one that just based on the topography and the wetlands in the middle, um, we did review this multiple times with um, the fire department and just they felt they had adequate access, access to the buildings for fire protection at the buildings now. And then 8.1, I think Tim suggested, uh, rec discussed before, and that's related to uh, the temporary CO so that we can open the clubhouse for leasing purposes. So that's my my two minute overview so that we can get to public, but happy to discuss any of these if you think it's that, that, that was very helpful. Thank you. And chair questions, comments. Yes. Yeah, this is Sarah Welsh. Um, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Fenstermacher. I just want to verify something under uh, six five B four. Um, I don't understand. Uh, are you going to be supplying sidewalks along the street frontage, i.e. on the road? Because there's no sidewalks there now. Or are you talking about within the the project? No, we're asking for a waiver because there's a, um, a multi-use path on the east side of Mount Support. Um, I think it's 8 to 10 feet wide. It's protected by a curb. It's protected by... A landscape strip, and that we'd like to minimize the amount of pavement out there. Now it would have additional wetland impacts and overall um, environmental impacts that we feel that it's sufficient to provide access from our site to the 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 already existing larger uh, sidewalk system that's out there. Well, how are they going to get from the left-hand side, the western side of Mount Support Road? over to the right hand side crossing over what's going to be the busiest road in in all of grafton county once all these projects get built don't you think having a sidewalk that will give them a place to stand 
in order to make sure they can cross over to where the bus stop is, which is not directly opposite your entrance. Is that not correct? Yes, I understand you're going to have your bus, your private shuttle go into the property, but if somebody would like to take advanced transit, how are they going to get across to the east side of Mount Support Road heading north without a, a sidewalk which to de- delineate where the road is? Does that make sense? Am I making? Well, I think what we're doing, we're bringing the everyone from our property to a single crossing point, and there's already been comments from staff about implementing um, the flashing crossing signs. So our our we're preparing to provide a safe crossing with okay. warnings there. I think that actually is probably better off than having the two si- two sidewalks on either side. Um, Because this actually provides a one single crossing point for better. Provided you can get all of your residents to cross over there. (laughs) Well, it's the only way they can get to the um, to Mount Support is through. uh, We have one sidewalk that goes out. Okay. 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 I think I'm going to end this part of our discussions and finally get to the public. Um, I don't know how many people are online from the public. Uh, Those of you who are there, I thank you for your patience. We did hear from the chair of the conservation committee. So if you were still there, I will ask you to go first. Yeah, yes, I'm still here. I'm Ernst Ortmann, chair of the conservation committee. The conservation committee had a meeting uh, about this project on March 12th. And I submitted a memo of understanding, at least a memo of suggestions, uh, the next day. Um, The Conservation Committee does not decide or uh, 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 makes decisions about uh, these things. Um, The the one thing we did was we reviewed the application and waived our right to intervene. That doesn't mean that we don't have suggestions. Let me just quote from my letter. We're very concerned about the extraordinary amount of parking spaces. Um, So we recommend that that be as much as possibly reduced, particularly in the circumferential parking lots, um, or uh, use covered uh, parking spaces uh, somewhere under the buildings, uh, maybe sacrifice one of the floors. the other thing we, I didn't mention that, is uh, more and more people will use electrical cars. Uh, will there be uh, charging stations? Uh, more and more people will use electric bikes or plain bikes to get around, particularly since they are so short, uh, close to um, the hospital and Santerra. Uh, other suggestion would be to uh, to limit lighting uh, so that uh, that either goes by on demand. So the, if a parking lot is not used, the lights go out after five minutes. If somebody enters the parking lot, the, the, the lights go on again, etc. Another issue would be uh, solar panels, at least on the roofs of these flat buildings, or otherwise uh, over the parking spots. Uh, I've, I've seen many uh, spots uh, during my travels where the parking spots are used for solar panels. Um, another big co- uh, concern the Conservation Committee has is wildlife corridors. Uh, they're very limited on this plan. And um, they're re- we're really dealing with two roads, Route 120 and uh, Mount Support Road, which animals have to cross. Uh, nobody keeps uh, to the speed limit, so speed bumps might be appropriate, but uh, we would highly recommend that with this development and the neighboring dev- development to the south coming up soon to anyone across the street, that um, wildlife corridors be very carefully uh, considered. Then um, the coordination of all these developments is extremely important. I think you're aware of all the issues, uh, particularly with traffic studies. Well, once one study regarding one development will add traffic, the next uh, development will add traffic, and suddenly we're really at a bottleneck uh, traffic situation. Um, of course, um, uh, sidewalks and the bicycle paths are extremely important. 
for these young students who are going to use this. And uh, last but not least, um, conservation. The site encompasses 53 acres, of which 18 are designated for buildings and parking lots. The conservation committee recommended that uh, the current conservation of the remaining 35 acres be made permanent so that there's no later in the development changing uh, available space and, and the, the, the Michaels will say, well, we got that space, we need another uh, two towers to be built there for students so that it gets permanently preserved, conserved. That probably will need an official conservation easement. Let me see what else. Uh, well, I admire all your people's endurance with all these meetings. So thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Mr. Oldman. I appreciate that. Joan, you were curious as to what the commission um, debated. Your opportunity to ask Mr. Oldman. Uh, all I would say is thank you very much, Dr. Waitman. Um, I still say I would I would really like it in future if we could have copies of the of the actual minutes and with everything online and and so easily done uh, through e communicating I, I I know it's not necessarily your power to do that um, but I throw that idea out there that um, I appreciate the the summaries but I also think that a lot of a lot of um, uh, tidbits of knowledge that that goes into the advice would also be very helpful and be very educational uh, for us. But thank you, Dr. Reitman, for Do your attendance. Reply on that. The meetings are public and the minutes are available online within a week or so, maybe two weeks. Yeah, Just and, and city site and, and read the minutes. And this is Tim, that the applicant wasn't required to go to the Conservation Commission or, or uh, before they went to the Planning Board. So if and when the applicant goes before the Conservation Commission, before they go to the Planning Board, then we'd be happy to provide the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other persons from the public who would like to speak? All right, I don't hear anyone else. Um, we now have 16 minutes left. I know we have at least a question about other business and adjournment. Um, so I'm just gonna ask the board members, do you have anything else that you'd like to come back on and either uh, continue the discussion or other new points in the very brief time that we have remaining? Everybody just exhausted. Mr. Chair, this is Tim Corwin again. Yep. Um, I, I have a, a general question for the board. It, it, uh, following up on uh, Ms. Romano's suggestion about uh, placing a condition of approval on the project, limiting uh, or I guess excluding undergraduates from from renting uh, one of the units at the property. Is there, I, I, I think David, David mentioned that there there's certainly legal risk that is is attend, would would be attendant to imposing such a, a condition on the property. I think there's also a very um, significant enforcement issue. It's it's not clear at all how that that condition would 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 be enforced. Um, and so before we consult legal counsel uh, as to um, specifically consult legal counsel specifically as to the propriety of imposing this this type of condition it, it, I just wanted to get a sense is there is that is that something that the, the board in general is interested in in pursuing uh, mr. chair and Tim this is Laurel Davis yes Laurel um, yes it's something that I would be interested in pursuing and I would also be interested in asking the applicant and or Dartmouth, if they would be willing to share a copy of the agreement between them. Because as we, the more we discuss this, the more it, it just occurs to me that we don't know of whom we're asking what. 
and I, and I I also have a question, if I may, of of Michael's. I understand that you are very experienced in building these um, types of housing. Have do you have experience in building student housing, whether it's graduate or undergraduate, in a municipality other than the municipality in which the campus proper is located? I believe we do. If you could, if you could uh, provide some examples of that at our next meeting, that would be really helpful to me. Okay. Yeah. M Mr. Chair, this is Tim. Uh, yes, again, Tim. just just a point of clarification. At, at a minimum, it, it it is clear that that the property owner is always responsible. They cannot contract away their responsibility for uh, for for being being liable and responsible for what for what the land use approval requires or permits. So at a minimum, it is always the property owner. There's no question about that. It could it, it may also be it may also be the operator or the tenant, but it is always at least the property owner. Chair, this is Kathy. I, I had no intention of suggesting something that would put the city in legal jeopardy. But I do think that looking um, at a housing project that is meant to house adults who are graduate students is different from trying to police an undergraduate student complex with 600 and some people and I, I was hoping that there was some way that we could be protected from, you know, being the location of a large number of um, undergraduate students. I, I think that's an entirely different makeup uh, of a complex in terms of responsibilities and experience and everything than a, a graduate student housing. And I know that we've heard several times that the intention is um, to be graduate student, but I was just researching whether there was any way to, um, you know, carve that in stone. I think the answer is no. I've not heard anything from staff. Um, so. Right, but I mean, I've said this before, in terms of how the priority lease up is working, it's going to go from graduate students to Dartmouth Hitchcock employees to Dartmouth College employees. By the time it'll come to open leasing for undergraduates, there won't be any units left because of the availability of these affordable units. It's a de facto reality. And the demand studies that we've seen for how much in need the college is for undergraduate students. I can also share that um, in markets, as a private owner and manager of student housing, we have no incentive to let our projects go awry to cause any issues for the municipalities we work in. Um, our, our goal is to have a successful attractive, well-managed property. We'll have on-site management facilities. We'll be hiring locally to do that. So I understand where your concerns are, and I will provide you examples of working in municipalities outside of where the college is located. But, you know, our success is your success, and we have no, we have no intention of going anywhere. We plan on being here, and we plan on having a well-managed property. Mr. Chair. Yes, David. This is David Brooks. Um, may I ask a, a question or two of, of the applicants? Please. Um, either Ms. Vagan or Mr. Justinski, is there, maybe Mr. Justinski, is there an obligation at Dartmouth for freshmen to live on campus? Uh, this is Dan Justinski, Director of Real Estate Dartmouth. You know, although the real estate office uh, primarily provides housing for graduate students and um, faculty and staff, I'm not aware of all the requirements for how undergraduates are. Uh, so I'm not I'm not at 
able to answer that. I can research it and get that answer back to you. David, okay. this is Laurel Stavis. Um, and I worked at Dartmouth for two decades. And my understanding is that there absolutely is a requirement that first year students live on campus. Okay, but it's what, but I, I guess maybe Mr. Justinski can follow up and, and if it applies to freshmen, but maybe not sophomores, I, I, I wonder if that helps address Ms. Romano's concern or, or stated comments and questions. My other question again is, is maybe more for Mr. Justinski. Um, would Dartmouth security staff have any role on this property uh, given that it's college property, but it's not in Hanover, would they, would they have any enforcement role or, or security role to play here? Uh, thank you for the question. Our intention is that that it, this is not a Dartmouth safety and security property for uh, patrolling. This is uh, City of Lebanon and um, the the proper management by Michaels and the, and the control of the tenancy. Um, so it, it is not expected to be a safety and security uh, rolling place uh, on that one. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm going to bring this discussion. I think we've had a very fruitful discussion this evening. I uh, thank the applicant. I think the board members. Um, I'm going to bring this to a close. Um, and then go back to our agenda because we have a very few minutes remaining. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Yes, Chair, Tim. Is Tim uh, you should you should have a motion. No, I, to continue I, I need a motion to continue this. You're absolutely right. I need a motion to continue this until the June 8th meeting. Thank you for that, Tim. So moved, Mr. Chair. This is Laurel Davis. Thank you, Laurel. Tom Mark seconds. Thank you, Tom. So, is there any discussion? So I I am in favor. Jim, Councilor Winnie is in favor. Joan, Monroe is in favor. Laurel, Laurel is in favor. Kathy, Kathy votes yes. Sarah, Sarah votes yes. And Tom, Tom is in favor. So that's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. Does anyone have any other business? Staff, do you have any other business? Not, not me. Not Tim. Mr. Chair, we, yes. we do have uh, some vacancies on various boards and committees. Um, we could either take that up tonight. Uh, I know Mr. Martz has, has put his name into the hat. Uh, or we can save that for next week's meeting when you cover board board and committee reports. Why don't we save it for next week? Are those the two, are there any others? I know Tom has volunteered for two subcommittees. So maybe uh, David, if you have it handy, you could remind members what other positions are still. We might yes. get a volunteer by next yes. week. Yeah. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Martz has has put his name in for Ped and Bike Committee, Ped and Bike Advisory Committee, also for the Capital uh, Improvement Program Subcommittee, and the Steering Committee for the Implementation of the Master Plan. Um, the remaining vacancy is with the Heritage Commission. So if any uh, member is interested, I encourage you to contact David or Tim during the week, and we'll be more than happy to get you on the Heritage Commission. All right, with that, I'll ask a member uh, for a motion to adjourn. Councilor Winnie, move to adjourn. Councilor Winnie, I heard first. And second by Monroe. Second by Joan. Any discussion? So I am in favor. Jim? Yes. Councilor Winnie votes yes. Joan? Uh, votes yes. Laurel? Laurel votes yes. Kathy? Kathy votes yes. Sarah? Sarah votes yes. 
and Tom. Tom votes yes. All right, that's unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Safe travels home. <laughs> Damn it.